have you gone live pranjay uh, yes sir we are live now okay okay yeah. it's not 7 uh, yet right no it's it's exactly 7 just now okay okay because uh, this okay students have uh, started joining yeah hi kalpak hi jobindo good evening let's uh, wait for few more minutes so uh, for other participants to join so joginder and kalpak uh, by any chance uh, are there uh, any exams uh, going on hi sumit because what i got to know was last uh, weekend okay last weekend there were some exams right uh, which you guys were writing okay this week there is no exam okay 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 so all all of you uh, did you attend the previous session because i am not sure kalpak uh, i i think you were there right uh, jogendra sumit i am not sure so kalpak was there and sumit was not there okay and okay jogendra was there okay great right. just give me a moment so uh, we'll just get started with it okay got it kalpak okay yeah. Okay, so it is seven not two. Hi, Shubhendu. Good evening. Okay, so let's uh, get started now. Okay, so uh, what we are going to today, uh, right in the live session, we'll continue uh, building on our demand forecasting topic. right so we started our discussion right uh, in our live session 1 and we were trying to form the core right we were trying to understand the basics which would help us continue right drive our discussions uh, in rest of the sessions so the, uh, in today's discussion the focus is going to be on the yeah kalpak yeah yeah i yeah, am coming to that so the focus is going to be on uh, demand forecasting like i said but here we are going to talk about the quantitative aspect right uh, what are the various methods right uh, quantitative methods through which we can estimate predict or generate the forecast right so that is going to be uh, the core agenda of today's uh, session so what i will do is that first i'll uh, and maybe some of you like uh, were not there in the uh, first uh, session right and maybe you were part of the briefing session that we did on the uh, hbr simulation uh maybe uh, some of you had also not attended the briefing session so broadly uh, i am rahul goel right so i have done my uh, mba in supply chain and information technology from niti mumbai i am also a btech in uh, information technology i did my post graduate diploma in machine learning and artificial intelligence from bits pilani i am also certified in theory of constraints uh, by goldrat uh, school certified in six sigma project management and uh, zero defect zero effect program from ministry of commerce and i have been associated with uh, nasi munji in various capacities since 2018 so i have close to uh, 12 years of experience now across uh, various uh, companies uh, good companies uh, uh, you know they are uh, either number 1 or number 2 in the segment that they play so the kind of experience that i bring is uh, uh, from fashion and apparel consumer healthcare fmcg and uh, beauty right so that's in brief about me 
so uh, some of you are joining for the first time right very quickly what we are trying to do in live sessions is to pick up some of the important concepts right and not everything because async is your core content right and it's been beautifully designed it's been very uh, you know a lot of efforts are gone into explaining uh, the whole subject here the idea is to pick some uh, relevant uh, some important concepts out of uh, the async and review them right try to link them with uh, some of the case slides some of the case studies some of my experience uh, that i have been part of uh, you know uh, in these companies and maybe pick up some of the best practices from other industries right and to have uh, you know uh, a lively uh, discussion around those the uh, examples right so this is broadly uh, what i had shown last time in terms of the coverage so session 1 was about uh, introducing the subject to all of you then uh, deep dive in the demand forecasting right and there the focus was to talk about qualitative here in session 2 today like i said that we are going to focus on quantitative forecasting causal forecasting and if time allows we will discuss about demand forecasting and its linkage to inventory management third session is going to be all about inventory optimization and fourth session is going to be about network optimization right so most of the ground work or most of the leg work you have already done in your previous uh, subject which is operations and supply chain management right so there you would have uh, learned end to end what operations mean what supply chain management mean here we are trying to dial up the quotient of analytics right so that is why you will see that we have picked up only three uh, areas in operations and supply chain management which is demand forecasting inventory management and network or facility management right because these are the three areas where uh, we have seen right uh, the quotient of analytics uh, being significant right while there are other parts of uh, supply chain and operations as well, for example supply planning sourcing right manufacturing where analytics uh, uh, can be made use of to drive decision making right uh, of the management or the managers but here we are going to focus on these three uh, topics right so uh, this is uh, what the schedule is so we have already done two sessions so one was live session all right so we had done briefing session uh, on 1st of february today we are going to have session 2 then in the coming uh, and tomorrow morning we will have session 3 next uh, weekend uh, saturday evening we will have our uh, concluding session uh, where we will discuss network optimization and it will be followed by a debriefing session on the root beer simulation that all of you guys are taking right so uh, some uh, quick uh, comments on the term and exam right so uh, your term and exam uh, you will find questions which will be derived or which will be designed uh, from the content of both async and sync uh, sessions right uh, so you have to cover both uh, you know uh, the areas questions will be largely case slides based wherein you will be given a small or a mini case right and you'll be expected to apply uh, uh, the concept that uh, you are learning and questions will range from easy to difficult right and in one of the sessions maybe tomorrow or the uh, tomorrow session or the final session i'll be sharing some sample questions right so obviously those questions are not going to appear as this you know uh, or uh, you know you not not find them in any of your exam but it will just give you a flavor of how question will look like yeah so kalpak uh, this is a analytics uh, like i said that uh, this is we are going to talk about lot of analysis uh, right lot of uh, application of analytics in these three areas so there will be uh, some case that which would uh, ask you to uh, you know do some uh, analytics based the uh, data that is given right so you can expect okay so this is uh, what we are going to uh, discuss uh, today in our session right so we are going to talk about time series methods right uh, these are the quantitative ways of generating a forecast so we are going to talk about host of uh, methods or uh, you know various techniques we are going to talk about simple moving average simple exponential smoothing we are talk going to talk about arima the uh, another technique but we are only going to look at uh, a very broad very top view of arima and not going to talk about application or any demo as such we are also going to talk about some of the kpis that we measure or we check to say which model is doing better right when it comes to forecasting then we are going to talk about a different set of methods which are called as causal methods and there we are going to look at three key or three uh, important method which is regression econometric and leading uh, indicator then uh, uh, we will talk about 
what are the different criteria so if you are let us say in a situation or if you are trying to forecast a product how do you decide that should i go ahead with time series or should i go ahead with causal or should i go ahead with the qualitative method right so as a demand forecaster or as a person who is uh, you know given this job right so this has to be analysis driven right there has to be a little bit of analytics performed to say okay which forecasting method will be the best for forecasting method in a given situation or a context right and then we will look at some of the leading solutions right so today while there will be many companies who will be still doing forecasting in excel files right or will be uh, doing it in some you know small scale software but there are organizations or there are mature organizations who have adopted right state of the art planning platforms wherein forecasting is one of the capabilities right so i will be uh, discussing some of the leading uh, platforms which are available in the market some of the characteristics an organization try to find in those leading platforms right uh, when they have to decide you know so there are almost 15 to 20 planning platforms available or forecasting platforms available right which one do you choose you know what are what is the framework or what are the various criteria or element that you look into any tool to say okay this tool will be best for my situation or for my organization right so this is going to be the agenda for today's session but like kalpak said uh, let's quickly uh, recap right what we had seen in session 1 right because there was some, uh, some bit of session one that we had we could not cover so we will cover that first uh, and we will also do a quick recap of what we had covered right so that people uh, persons uh, or the uh, uh, students who were not part of session 1 right uh, they will be uh, brought on board uh, with the content right so let's quickly go back and see what we had uh, covered in uh, session 1 first and if anyone has any uh, question right uh, please uh, put that in chat you can also choose to you know speak if you have any example or uh, any point to discuss uh, that is okay right okay so people who are not uh, uh, there in the session 1 right, because of their exams so this is uh, going to be the uh, overall uh, let me just yeah one second yeah so this was the agenda of our live session one right so first we understood what supply chain is so this is to you know just uh, bring back you know uh, a refresher sort of a thing what you had learned in operation and supply chain management so what is meant by supply chain right so i had shared one example i shared one case study right from one of my earlier organizations to explain this concept then we saw what logistics means right then we saw what analytics means right uh, what uh, what is the progression or what is the evolution which is uh, present when it comes to field of analytics then we saw what is the importance and role of analytics right so there is a logical flow in the content that we covered in like session 1 so first definition of supply chain then logistics and definition of analytics and role of analytics and supply chain logistics the challenges right so what challenges are faced by data scientist or what challenges are faced by business analyst or supply chain analyst when they try to uh, apply some of the tools some of the uh, tech uh, techniques right uh, in uh, the field of supply chain right uh, when it comes to analytics then we uh, started deep diving in demand forecasting right so again a refresher on what demand forecasting is about right uh, what are various types of demand how what are uh, the various uh, aspects uh, in which analytics is uh, applied uh, in uh, the use case of demand forecasting right then talk about qualitative forecasting and conclude so i think we covered till point number 6 in our previous session so we will cover point 7 point 8 and then move on to our uh, agenda of uh, session 2 right so this is what we discussed uh, in our last uh, in in our last session right uh, so we said uh, hi others uh, i just saw so that more people joined hi anu hi kunal pradeep steven hi vinay good evening hi all of you can hear me right great 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 hi hi okay okay so this is what we saw last time right uh, when we connected so i introduced to you uh, apex right american production and inventory control society and most of you did not know what apex was or what apex is right so 
uh, apex is uh, like in project in field of project management right uh, pmi is a not for profit body of knowledge right uh, which provide guideline as to how we should manage projects as a project manager right they mention best in class practices right they also provide host of certifications right uh, similarly when we talk about uh, supply chain right uh, when we talk about supply chain there is a body of knowledge right there is a community which uh, provides uh, best in class practices right it also provides uh, you know definition to uh, some of the common terms in supply chain and operations right so like we have pmi in project management similarly we have apex in supply chain and uh, we saw the definition of supply chain given by apex right which was uh, which is a system a supply chain being a system of organizations so a lot of organizations are involved uh, in supply chain a lot of people are involved technologies are involved information and resources are involved and why are they involved right they are involved with a uh, some set of objectives right and all of these things are involved to make possible the movement of material right to make possible the movement of products and services all the way right from raw material packaging material providers through the manufacturing and distribution process eventually in the hand of customer or consumers right so all of this movement which is happening right and there are a lot of value added activities which are happening on the raw material packaging material right uh, to provide uh, the required product or service to the consumer so this chain right uh, this chain through which all of these different organizations in terms of suppliers in terms of manufacturers distributors retailers right all of them are connected is called a supply chain right and the management of this right so when we talk about management you have to do planning you have to do sourcing you have to do manufacturing you have to do logistics you have to do reverse logistics so to manage all of this you need a lot of things right you need to manage information you need to do a lot of step run processes manage input output right so the whole management of this chain is called a supply chain right so in last uh, session i uh, uh, discussed one case study right one example uh, like i said from one of my earlier companies wherein we saw the manufacturing footprint of that organization where plants are spread uh, uh, you know across uh, uh, india right and we discussed what would be the various reasons why an organization would choose to have so many manufacturing plants uh, across the regions right then we looked at the vertical flow of supply chain wherein we said that uh, plants convert raw material packaging material into finished goods then those are sent to regional warehouses right and which are then further moved in the chain by distributors and stockists we discussed in detail you know why a uh, manufacturer cannot directly send the goods to consumer right so we discussed about efficiency we discussed about the breaking of the bulk right and why manufacturer is not interested most of the times in shipping directly to consumer because it is cost prohibitive or not efficient for uh, him right so the role of each and every partner right in this chain uh, eventually consumers like you and i buying from uh, retailers right this retailer could be a normal kirana store or it could be a modern trade store like uh, you know jio uh, uh, or it could be uh, another store like big bazaar right or it could be an online retailer like amazon or flipkart right then we looked at a horizontal view of supply chain wherein we observed certain patterns you know emerging so as business analyst as supply chain analyst or as data people we need to look at data and find out uh, what data is speaking to us right so we saw when we look at this chart we see that from left to right the number of partners are increasing in the supply chain right so there are about uh, let's say 10 plants which are manufacturing then there are 31 depots which are helping in the distribution right these 31 depots in turn are providing goods to 850 distributors these 850 distributors are in turn providing goods to 8 lakh Uh, almost a million retailers right and these 1 million uh, close to 1 million retailers are servicing maybe you know multi million or billion of, of consumer right so we saw that when we move from left to right the complexity in terms of uh, people who are engaging with this chain or you know participating in this chain it grows right it grows significantly and imagine the kind of information exchange in, imagine the kind of uh, capital exchange imagine the kind of uh, you know movement of goods which is happening right or between uh, these uh, partners or these stakeholders it is inherently brings a lot of uh, complexity right so this is what we discussed uh, after this i am moving uh, i am moving a little bit fast because we had spent 3 hours right last time so just meant to be a refresher so uh, 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 people who have not uh, joined uh, right uh, so just 
you know uh, just to help you grasp the content so that you know you're not uh, fully lost uh, in today's discussion but uh, we'll strongly suggest that uh, you know whenever you get time please uh, go through that detailed discussion we had uh, last time on this uh, uh, topic okay so after that we spoke about logistics right so logist when we talk about logistics so what we discussed uh, was that for a business analyst or for a supply chain analyst to analyze let us say there are two organizations organization a and organization b and uh, you are being given a task that okay go and visit organization a go uh, and visit organization b and tell us which organization supply chain is good or competitive right so you cannot simply go you know take a round in factories or take a round in warehouses or you know meet certain people and form a view right that view could be a heavily biased view right so you need to have a access to a certain framework through which you will evaluate right the organize the supply chain of organization a and b and say okay this organization seems to have better uh, you know set of processes or you know control over this part of the supply chain right so when we talk about uh, such a framework we talk about plan source make and deliver right and this framework was also discussed in your earlier course operations and supply chain management right so when we talk about planning whatever is in, involved in uh, in terms of demand planning supply planning right whenever we talk about uh, sourcing so how do we procure raw material packaging material how do we evaluate our suppliers what is our sourcing process right when we talk about make we talk about manufacturing right quality control various different ways through which we uh, you know uh, run our uh, mrp process or master production uh, you know schedule processes and delivery right logistics so logistics when we say so here you can see that source make and deliver and when we talk about deliver logistics part of uh, or the element of that framework we talk about these aspects right which you would have covered in detail in your earlier course so you just understood what distribution means how it is different from transportation right uh, what is meant by inventory right what are the various aspects or what are the various application why do we need to have inventory in supply chain right how do you plan or uh, you know strategize logistics uh, and some of the warehousing operations so when we talk about logistics right we talk about all of these elements right so from the process point of view what is the definition of logistics so logistics is the process of moving and positioning inventory right and why do we need to move and position the inventory because we want to meet customer requirements right but at the same time there are some overriding objectives of this logistics function or logistics element right so while we place and move inventory right through a network through this chain there are a few things which needs to be kept in mind right so first is that there has to be a minim a target of minimizing the total landed cost right the cost at which we are servicing the consumer or customer has to be minimized right because it will directly impact your profitability right you have to have you know uh, do that with the help of minimal assets right if you are requiring large number of fleets or large number of warehouses or you know secondary logistics and all of that it again you know uh, will add to your total landed cost in servicing a consumer and you and when we talk about inventory management which is uh, anyways uh, the uh, uh, core content of our tomorrow discussion you will see how important it is to get inventory management right right it's a straight away hit right to a profitability to top line if inventory is not managed well okay so when we talk about some of the use cases some of the case studies we are going to focus on these aspects right so basically two aspects one is inventory management and second is the network or the route uh, optimization okay so last time we saw a uh, business analytics right uh, like i said that what is the progression or what is the evaluation right and i'm sure you would have seen this chart right uh, in some of your earlier courses uh, related to analytics and here it just uh, you know uh, showing you the degree of uh, difficulty right and the evolution on the uh, y axis right so there are currently many organizations right even very big organizations who have not moved you know uh, beyond descriptive right so they have you know certain mechanism they have certain report they have certain people who does all the time only the descriptive uh, uh, or describing the event right in terms of what happened right uh, how was the sales last month against uh, the forecast right uh, they will make certain you know simple uh, alert mechanism at their end right so this is very uh, elementary very rudimentary uh, level of uh, business analytics right then there are organizations which have moved up a step in the ladder 
to perform diagnostics, right? So whatever data is coming, they are trying to understand, right? The root cause or the attribution, right? Why was the service level low? Why are we carrying high inventory? Why were why were uh, you know there stock out, right? So they are asking all of those questions. Why was the forecast accuracy low, right? Why the cost is high? Why the cost is low, right? So they are asking the why part behind the descriptive data to understand some of the root causes, right? So they are performing statistical analysis, they are mining the data, right? They are trying to get data from different sources in one place, right? And have certain business uh, intelligence tool, right? To get to the diagnostic uh, aspect, right? Of the analytics. Then there are certain organizations which have moved another level up in the ladder, right? Which is predictive. So they are making use of some of the uh, leading, right? Uh, technologies or leading frameworks or elements to forecast, right? So they can, uh, commit to a certain service level in future, they can commit to a certain forecast accuracy in future, they can predict, you know, how is the uh, inventory going to look like at the end of the year, right? They can give a view on the possible top line and bottom line of the company, right? Given the forecast that they have, right? And how the market is evolving. So they can do all of that predictive stuff, right? With the help of, again, a combination of data science and statistics based uh, approaches, right? And then there are some organizations quite evolved, right? Uh, who have moved uh, very fast, right? And uh, it reflects in their market share also. They do prescriptive analytics, right? Wherein the analytics suggest, right? So for example, if an organization wants to grow by 40%, right? What should they do so that the growth is 40%, right? So it will be prescribing them a recipe. Okay, if you spend this much on media, if you spend this much on consumer offer, if you launch so many products, right, it will, all of these initiatives will add up to give you a growth of 40%, right, which is, let us say, maybe twice of the uh, growth at which the category uh, in the market is growing, right. So, and another comment which I made uh, in the last class is that it is very difficult to say whether an organization is at a certain level, right, uh, of the evolution. In the same organization, you will find either departments, or within departments, mini department where let us say we talk about supply chain, right? So if you go to an organization and visit their supply chain, you will find supply planning, demand planning, customer service, right? Manufacturing, procurement, right? So there are these mini, mini functions, right? Uh, and they have a very specific role to play in supply chain and operational management. You will find out that, okay, in demand planning, this team is actually using machine learning to generate forecast. Right. So they are at this level when it comes to demand planning. Right. Now, when it comes to supply planning, right, which is a response to a demand plan, and you would have studied this in operations and supply management, what supply planning or supply plan is, they are not using any software, they are not using any predictive uh, capabilities or, uh, you know, predictive. Uh, approach they're only describing what has happened right okay which means that okay what stocks are going to come what stocks are already in a wip you know how how much of uh, stock we already have uh, on hand so they're only describing what is already there right so in this in one organization within a function there are many functions and you will see that one of them are at a very different level of maturity the other function is just starting uh, with the analytics right so it becomes very difficult right, uh, to assess or say if truly an organization 100% has reached to prescriptive or because there's a trade-off involved, right? Because prescript to reach to a prescriptive and predictive level, it doesn't come free. You need to have tools, you need to have skill set in people, right? You need to train people or you need to get people from outside. You need to have a long-term vision and these technologies and these approaches need patience, right? So if you're expecting that we deploy machine learning and generating a focus, which is going to be 80%, 90%, accurate, it's not going to happen, right? There is a whole pipeline which needs to be created, right? Data maturity threshold has to be there, right? And only when you are prepared with the data, you are prepared with the use case, you're prepared with the right technology in terms of platform, right? In terms of model, only then you go ahead and then uh, do an exercise like this and that Again, it's not going to be a guarantee, right? You have to test and learn, test and learn, and see this approach is really giving you a differential value, add, right? So most of the companies don't have that appetite, right? Don't have that patience. But then there are some leading organizations that you would see in market, you know, who have already invested, right? And who are already, you know, a multi uh, steps ahead, you know, when it comes to prescriptive and predictive. So uh, some of the case studies that we saw. Uh, in our uh, session one, so we uh, uh, saw a case study of uh, missing a story of missing bullet holes and Abraham Wall. And some of you told me that uh, you know this uh, example case study you have already had seen, right? So uh, there's a comment. Yeah, 
Yeah, so Kalpak uh, said yes, this we have seen. But anyways, the idea was to, uh, the, the bottom line in this example was that we need to see data, right, from all the perspectives. So here they were trying to understand that which part of the plane they should armor more, they should strengthen more, so that when they are uh, going in a war, there's a higher probability of they coming back, right? So they were looking at uh, some of the planes who had actually come back from the war, right? And seen where uh, all of the bullet, uh, you know, uh, impacts were there, right? But then there was this person, there was a statistician, right, uh, who said, that this is not the right data that we are looking at or we should be looking at right so he said that uh, the data which should which should be very important for our decision making is actually not there right and that data would be the planes which have not come back from the war right because they would have got hit in those places or those part of planes which are more vulnerable right so he said that uh, he made a counter you know uh, uh, he made a counter uh, proposal to what military or navy brought to that statistician to say okay let's look at those areas where there are no bullet uh, holes all right there are no bullet uh, imprints right because those are the ones those are the areas where the plane most probably when it's getting hit is not coming back right so this is like for example the this part of the plane right in front and the fuselage and all and that is where they realize they need to armor more right and uh, they wouldn't have gone ahead with armoring everything in the plane because adding more armor, you know, brings, uh, makes plane heavier, right? And makes it difficult to fly. Similarly, you know, less of armor also doesn't uh, solve their problem, which was the core problem statement. So the story, the main uh, idea behind this uh, was to whether for an analyst or, you know, whether it's a business analyst, analyst or a supply chain analyst or a data analyst to see if they're looking at the, you know, correct data for the use case or the for, for the problem statement which they are trying to problem solve, right? Then we looked at uh, another uh, case study wherein you were uh, given two scenarios, right? So there was a set of cargo, right? Uh, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, you were supposed to salvage and you were given uh, two plans, right? So you were given one situation, two plans, and you had to choose which one of, uh, you know, uh, you will uh, uh, go ahead with. And then we saw that there were people, right, uh, who had, so in the, these two given uh, options, plan A and plan C were actually the same. The only difference was the way the plan was provided to you, right? For example, in plan C, it was written that if you go ahead with this plan, the plan will result in the loss of two thirds right, two of the three cargoes worth dollar five uh, hundred thousand, right? And in the second case, it was given that if you go ahead with plan A, this will save one cargo worth 250K, right? Now, if you look closely, plan A and plan C are same, right? But in the first situation, we are talking in language of losses, right? In the second cases, we are talking in language of savings, right? So we saw that there were people, right, who had a certain bias, right? And they went ahead with if they had selected plan C here, they had selected plan B, right? In this case, right? Similarly, vice versa. So this is also a sort of trap, right? When we look at uh, analytics or when we try to read a certain situation, you know, our own bias also sometimes fits in, right? So this was just to make it evident, right? When we are looking at data, or when we are looking at a certain problem statement, we have to be a little bit vigilant or aware that our own bias is not, uh, you know, uh, creeping in while we are problem solving a particular situation, right? So this trap is called a framing trap, right? So first set of solutions were all uh, negative. The second set of solutions were all positive, right? So and this, while we perform this uh, simple, uh, you know, uh, example or a simulation on a few number of people, usually it is done on thousands of people, right? And we can clearly see that uh, in the first case, wherein we are talking about positive uh, framing, 60% of them went ahead with recovering with a plan which recovers one cargo, right? But in the second scenario, 62% of them went ahead with, you know, uh, uh, the uh, scenario D, right? Wherein it was uh, to lose nothing, right? Or either lose uh, all three. 
so this was the second uh, case study that we discussed and last class we also uh, spoke about the role of analytics right in supply chain and logistics specifically and not marketing or sales right so while analytics has a very significant role to play in other uh, verticals in other uh, functions but we specifically wanted to understand the role of analytics or challenges in applying analytics uh, in supply chain and operation so to do, do that we looked at uh, one of the uh, survey that was done by accenture consulting and uh, mit uh, institute right and the objective of the survey was to understand right uh, how uh, you know the top leaders in these organization you know look at uh, data analytics and automation when it uh, comes to you know providing the opportunities so the, the responses came from almost 800 participants right and 95% of them you know reported that uh, the data analytics daa data analytics and automation you know either meets or exceeds their expectation in terms of supply chain benefits and when we talk about supply chain benefits they are very well linked with the organizational benefits right so what are the top organizational objectives or benefits to increase top line which is revenue right to increase bottom line which is profit right to increase customer satisfaction right to create loyalty with the customer right reduce costs right so these are all not supply chain objectives these are all organizational objectives right which are coming through supply chain right uh, when analytics are applied right and they also said that within next few years right three out of four companies will modify their supply chain and operations to augment right data analytics and automation as capabilities right to and they also wanted to set up the master data and analytics function you know build their skill set in terms of data science right people who can perform uh, you know uh, data science uh, um, algorithm models feature engineering create end to end pipeline and, and keep on doing that continuous improvement work right so uh, advantages, like I said, that there are while data analytics or uh, let's say overall uh, analytics can be applied to any aspect of supply chain and operation. But it, through the survey, it was also asked that which part of supply chain do you think analytics will give the maximum return on investment? And here they had highlighted two areas. So one is demand forecasting, which anyways we are discussing, right? And second is about end-to-end -end visibility, okay? the uh, question when it was asked that what are the top challenges when it comes to uh, you know application of analytics uh, in supply chain and operation data was the number one challenge right and most of you would know right uh, data being available even if data is available the quality of data right uh, the consistency with this, with which this data is being churned out right is a challenge right so data is a challenge, right? The lack of the skill set, even if uh, high uh, dimensional or high quality data is there, but are there people, are there capable people to work with that data? Do they have enough uh, knowledge uh, about various tools or framework which are available, right? To generate or mine or, uh, you know, get insights from the data, right? And also the security uh, or the privacy around the data, right? So here, uh, right, uh, while some of you were not there, right? Uh, do you, in your uh, experience, right, have you seen any other challenge uh, other than data or lack of uh, capability, right, which can act as a hurdle in application of analytics <clears throat> in your respective area of work or in your organization? Have you come to, uh, across any other predominant challenge other than data or the lack of skill set? Kalpak, Deepti, anyone, uh, any other challenge other than this? Okay, Kalpak says uh, inference from the insights. Okay, while insights are there, but uh, whether the inference drawn is correct, right, or the usage of that insight to drive decision making is correct or not is a challenge. Okay, Deepti says, well, Deepti makes a very valid point, right? Uh, budget, because if there is no vision and there's no investment right behind setting up the you know analytics team behind you know uh, the vision not being there right to let us say have certain tools right business analytics tools right <clears throat> okay understand okay joginda is saying high dependence on business intuition while forecasting that's a great point yeah yeah in demand forecasting while anal uh, analyst analyst would want the forecasting to be as low touch or no touch 
but invariably sales and marketing would always want to override the forecast right with their bias with their judgment with their understanding of uh, the market right they would like to pollute or corrupt right while they, it is not their intention right why they don't want to purposefully spoil the forecast or touch the forecast it is just that they don't trust the forecast right or they don't trust the forecast which is generated by the machine or by any algorithm right okay okay so we saw another uh, case study last time right wherein uh, we said that uh, john snow right uh, the person who helped uh, contain cholera right in 1854 in england he also plotted right uh, the data right uh, to find out okay is there any specific area where the intensity of cholera is high and he tried to attribute the reason for the same so he could clearly identify certain patterns right so he could clearly identify some of the areas where you know the red dots are uh, the uh, intensity right the magnitude of cholera and he could see that there are certain areas where cholera is not that uh, intense uh, right and he could actually attribute the reason to one of the pumps right in that area which was providing water and he could link the spreading of the cholera to the water which was coming out of this pump right and when he said that remove this pump or you know stop supplying water he we, the they could see you know the cholera are not progressing and also coming down right so the looking at data plotting the data drawing an inference attributing uh, you know certain reason uh, to uh, uh, the one of the impact that is being seen right uh, so this also very early right uh, almost we are talking 19th uh, century right uh, where uh, anal uh, analytics was performed right uh, to identify the root cause uh, behind an epidemic okay then uh, we started our discussion right on the core topic uh, which is demand uh, planning and forecasting and we are going to see lot of analytics right uh, which gets supplied day in day out in generating a reasonable or trustable and accurate highly accurate forecast right so we uh, gone through lot of important concept lot of basic concepts uh, around demand planning forecasting we discussed what is meant by demand we discussed what is the difference between tertiary demand secondary demand primary demand right we discussed uh, some of the uh, basic forecasting techniques we discussed the difference between demand forecast demand plan and demand management right we discussed what demand shaping means what demand sensing means right what is meant by atl btl right above the line below the line inputs and how do they drive demand right and uh, we and this is what we discussed right uh, for demand planning and forecasting and after that we moved to uh, some of uh, the other uh, elements which was to and the fundamental question that we had asked in the group was uh, whether one model or one algorithm is suffice to forecast for short term mid term and long term right so when we talk about short term we are talking about generating the forecast for next three months let's say next two to three months right when we talk about mid term we are talking about generation of the forecast for four to six months right and when we are talking about long term anything beyond six months right while these definitions or these timelines right bucket can change from an organization to organization the fundamental question is whether one model has the capability to forecast all the three horizons right so the answer that came from group was it is not possible right because for us to forecast short term we need to look at recency recent data right so for us to look at mid term right we look, we want to look at you know other uh, indicators right uh, maybe level change maybe trend maybe seasonality right component and when we talk about long term forecast we have to look at cyclicity and other aspects right so we have to look at different models catering to these requirements to generate an accurate forecast right so we said that when we talk about demand planning forecasting horizon qualitative forecasting quantitative forecasting are various uh, elements which we need to take care of and we said that there are uh, three ways right broad ways of generating a forecast so intrinsic forecasting so basically when you can safely assume that whatever patterns were there in past you know for an sku or for an item the same patterns are going to continue to reflect in future right so you only depend upon your historical sale data to generate a forecast so that's called as intrinsic forecasting right when you assess that your organization product forecast is dependent on 
some external variables right these external variables could be linked to competitor activities these external variables or events could be linked to some of the macroeconomic uh, indicators like you know the uh, some of the policies regulations coming from the government right uh, or currency exchanges or whatever some of these could be linked to you know environment could be linked to weather right Uh, forecast and all of that so if there is a cause and effect relationship between the forecast of your product and these external variables then you can use causal forecasting right which anyways we are going to cover or this is also called as extrinsic forecasting right then there is called as simulation forecasting right wherein you would like to do simulation basis you know building certain scenarios right uh, and you can build say for example uh, you might want to know or you might want to create a scenario given let us say there is a new wave of covid which is going to come now multiple scenarios could be a very intense wave right impacting a nationwide lockdown there could be a medium uh, wave you know which will have part lockdown you know part opening up and there could be a very mild or a very uh, you know uh, not that impactful wave wherein you wouldn't you know uh, build a scenario with lot of impact on your sales right so when you generate those uh, scenarios you can do it with a combination of intrinsic plus extrinsic forecasting right so the this these are the three broad ways right which uh, through which you try to assess right what you are going to sell in future right uh, of your products okay so this is uh, where i think uh, we left right uh, our previous uh, discussion right any any questions so far on the content uh, that we covered last time any questions so far before we move ahead any question from anyone Okay, silence is approval. Okay, so if all of you are silent, then I will assume that all of you are okay, and there is no question. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, now uh, look at some of the basic principles, right, around demand forecasting, and why it is important to look at these principles because. uh when you are in a role of business analyst or when you are in a role of demand analyst or a supply chain analyst you need to know about these various characteristics of demand forecasting right to be able to uh you know drive your discussion with the functional team or with the business team right now this part of the discussion has to be a little interactive right and not uh, one sided so i would request all of you to participate here right now i have made few comments right about forecasting and why i think you should all be able to you know participate because you have studied about forecasting in detail in your previous subject right so my first comment is and you have to let me know right whether you agree with the comment or you don't agree right and if you have any point of view so my first comment is that forecast are usually wrong but what matters is how wrong they are are do you support this comment or you don't support this comment and what is the meaning of this right uh, how wrong what matters is how wrong they are okay kalpak says uh, forecast cannot be 100% accurate okay pradeep anu pratiksha shubhendu steven sumit vinay what are your uh, observation on this rather it should be forecast or not perfect okay kadeep says true okay so let 15% okay so steve see so i think uh, steve steven is making a very important point right and let me try and explain that point in a different manner right so let us say you are a supply planner what is the role of supply planner supply planner receives the forecast from a demand planner by looking at the forecast supply planner trigger certain actions what are the actions supply planner will look at the current inventory supply planner will look at wip supply planner will look at the inventory which is in transit right and basis that supply planner will calculate what additional inventory is required to support this demand which is come which has come from a demand planner right he will be doing all of those actions right to create 
or to calculate what additional stocks are required to support the demand of next month, next two, whatever that is, right? And then that view is being worked by factory planners, right? Factory planners will look at supply plan, convert it into, you know, requirements of raw material, packaging material with the help of MRP and master production schedule, right? And basis that uh, raw material, packaging material plan, sourcing will happen, right? Basically, you are going to buy raw material, packaging, you are going to spend money, right? So there's some serious work which is happening, you know, from demand plan to your raw material, packaging material sourcing, right? Now, let's say you're a supplier planner and you know that the forecast that is shared by demand planner is only 20% accurate. What will be your situation? Are you going to give a lot of weightage to that forecast? Will your headache grow or will you be cool about it? The forecast being only 20% accurate. Will it make your life difficult as a supply planner? Or will it make your life easy? Kalpak is saying, I am very happy if uh, forecast accuracy is 20%. right your life will become a nightmare right as a supply planner right because that forecast has no it is almost a useless basically indirectly we are saying is that that forecast is 80 percent inaccurate right if you try to produce or if you try to supply as per that forecast most of the times it will either lead to over out of stock or it will lead to overstocking right and if you try to take action on that forecast your own kpis will take a hit right and it will impact your profitability and top line in an extremely uh, uh, drastic uh, way, right? So what will you do to, uh, uh, you know, if you know that your demand plan of forecast is uh, extremely poor, you will try to play with inventory. You will try to play with capacity. You have to do a juggler's job, you know, because you don't know what accurate demand is going to look like, right? So you have to be always on your toes right to balance between inventory to balance between capacities right and play all of that leverage right so yours and the rest of the upstream supply chain job becomes a nightmare right <clears throat> versus a situation wherein you see that every time you know whenever demand planner is sharing the forecast which is let's say every month or every 15 days the forecast accuracy is as high as 80 percent does it make the life of uh, the rest of the uh, supply chain team easy or not Eighty percent accuracy, right? It is one of the best scenarios, right? It is one of the best in class accuracies, whatever level, whether it's national level or it is regional level or CFA level. Eighty percent accuracy. What it means is that your eighty percent of the job is done by a demand planner. You only have to take care of the twenty percent variability or 20% inaccuracy. That 20% inaccuracy is easy to manage, relatively easy to manage with the help of additional inventory, with the help of placing more inventory to the closer, you know, closer to the customer. And you can deploy a lot of inventory management or optimization techniques to take care of because your job is now limited or, you know, it's only scoped within that 20% inaccuracy, limited to maybe few SKUs, limited to maybe only few customers, right? And it's a solvable problem, right? So that is why the first comment that forecasts are usually wrong. Even the first forecast was wrong. Second scenario is also wrong. But what makes difference is how wrong they are, right? If they're only 80, if they're 80 percent accurate, only 20 percent wrong. Very, it's it's one of the best in class forecast accuracy because uh, forecasting demand is not easy, right? It has inherent variability, right? And getting a forecast accuracy of 20 percent creates a nightmare, right? Pretty clear, right? This point. Now, let's come to the second point, which is forecast on more accurate in shorter horizon. Is it true or is it false? Do you agree or not? Are forecasts more accurate in shorter horizon? Okay, why is that? Or let, and why forecasts are not accurate uh, for midterm or long term horizon? We saw three horizons, right? In pre on previous slide. So, why forecasts tend to be more accurate in shorter horizon? Okay, Anu is saying agree signality. Okay, it's one of the elements. Okay, Stephen is saying pestle factors. Okay, hmm. I think 
what joginder is saying you know is more relatable right let me try and explain it a little bit more in a lucid way right so let's say you are currently we are in the month of february right and you have to forecast for march april right okay so one scenario is wherein you are in the month of february you are a demand forecaster you are a demand planner or a demand analyst and you have to do a prediction for next month or next to next month right and you also have to do a prediction for let us say next year or let us say for the month of november and december right now when i am a planner or when i have to forecast for let us say march and april i mean february i have access to the latest feb data jan data december data i know what is going on in the market right in recent period i know how my sales have been, are doing i know what who are my today current active customers i know what is my current catalog catalog as in what are my current sku which i am selling right i know what are going to be my new launches in next two months right i know what are my phase outs or my end of life sku in next two months right i most probably know what is my competitor activity going to be in next two months right so when you are trying to forecast for short term you have access to most of the elements most of the components which can impact your forecast or demand right the latest data that you have right now let me know now all of this data is useful right because these are not obsolete or dated data and all of this will help you forecast uh, for next two months and hence your forecast is supposed to be accurate right because you are making use of all of the latest data and trying to find out the possibility of what you are going to sell right now if you try to make use of all of this data to forecast for something which is 8 months from now will that make sense what competition is doing today what you are doing today what product you are launching in next two months what has been your sale in last three months will all of this play an important role on what is going to happen 8 months from now 9 months from now we don't know right because the lag increases right what you are doing today maybe the impact of it 9 months 10 months from now will be not relevant right or maybe very little relevant competition is doing today but what they are going to do in 8 months from now even they will not know right forget about you knowing what competition is going to do right how will your economy uh, you know change you know what is going to be the purchasing power you know what is going to be the consumer behavior there could be four uh, more competitors you know who could enter into the market right so the variability or your capability to assess the situation 8 months or 9 months from now as you go ahead in future as the lag increases your capability to forecast decreases right so hence it is obvious that forecast for short term are more accurate than forecast for longer terms right now let's come to point number 3 right forecast are more accurate at aggregated levels do you agree or not agree forecast are more accurate at aggregated levels and they tend to become inact more inaccurate when you go lower and lower level okay joginder is saying yes forecast are more accurate at aggregated level because it balances out errors and outliers at lower level okay is there anyone who disagree with the statement because my second question is second part of this question is is it always a case okay steven is saying true but not in all cases okay steven can you give any example or support your statement when you say that there could be few cases where it will not happen so what jog what joginder said is a true statement okay so there are certain statements in demand planning or demand forecasting which are as good as law of physics so what he mentioned is a law of physics right so when you try to forecast at an aggregated level it balances out errors and outliers at lower level that's there's no doubt about it right but you are saying that no there's a possibility where forecast at a lower level could be more accurate so which means if what joginder is saying is 100% true there has to be another statement which is also true right and not counter to what joginder said 
anyone anyone who can support steven in the statement which he made okay the most of the people right uh, when they talk about this aspect of forecasting forecasting at a lower level of granularity versus forecasting at a higher level of granularity let me give an example right? there is a product a which gets sold in every city now there are two ways of forecasting right you can either generate the forecast for every city right for every city for example delhi bombay right and bangalore let's say three examples right three cities you look at the historical sales data for delhi mumbai bangalore right you use some methods forecasting methods to generate a forecast and to get a national level forecast you can add all the three forecast so this is called as generating a forecast at lower level and then adding the forecast to get a national level number right the other way is you can first generate you can add all the historical sales data for delhi mumbai bangalore to get a national level history and then you can generate a national level forecast now most of the people right understand that the second approach wherein you clubbed the historical sales data of all the three cities and then you generated a national level of forecast is going to be more accurate than what you had done in the first step wherein you had calculated a separate forecast for delhi mumbai and bangalore right why because in the second case all the errors right all the outliers you know most of the time they balance out each other and national level forecast is a much better or a more accurate forecast right now this is true but there is a second phenomena also which is happening which most of the people don't appreciate or you know identify right now when you try to forecast at a delhi level there is a delhi level trend there is a delhi level seasonality there is a delhi level uh, cyclicity right so each state or each city will have its own characteristics of a time series of demand right bangalore may give a different seasonality right bangalore may give a different seasonality trend right now when when we say that it balances out error or it uh, outliers it is true when all the three cities would more or less you know be in the same pattern right but if delhi bangalore and mumbai are starkly different and right and they demonstrate a very different behavior in terms of trend in terms of seasonality right then it makes sense to forecast them at their individual level because it will give a better forecast for each of these cities and also at an overall level so there are two opposite forces or opposite phenomena which is happening there could most of the time this phenomena which is cancelling out errors and outliers is bigger and this phenomena is smaller right and that is why your accurate become or your forecast become accurate at an aggregated level in certain exceptional cases this phenomena becomes smaller and this phenomena overrides right which is the individual characteristics you know become more predominant right and hence your forecast at lower level when generated becomes more accurate clear okay point number 4 that complex forecasting methods are not necessarily better right why so do you agree with this statement or no is it a guarantee that uh, complex forecasting methods will always generate uh, better forecast more accurate forecast is it, is it is it a guarantee anyone on point number 4 complex methods are not necessarily better okay so let me help you right so there are some deepthi saying okay yes okay okay so see there there is in the forecast world of forecasting right in the world of uh, demand prediction there are some annual tournaments which happens right and these annual tournaments or annual competition there are leading practitioners there are leading forecasters right who are called upon to compete and they compete uh, you know on the publicly available data right and they try to build 
model they try to build algorithms and then they try to generate an accuracy to beat you know the previous winner or the previous you know competition and every year this competition happens and in all the competition that have happened till now what they have found out is that complex methods right or let me make another statement right that simpler methods are either equal or better than the complex method when it comes to performance that has been their finding at least only in few cases exceptional cases complex methods like machine learning neural network have outperformed simpler methods right simpler methods over a long period of time right are either equal or better in their performance so there is no guarantee right that the complex methods which require a lot of investment in terms of money in terms of skill set will end up giving more accurate focus right so it is an empirical data right which you can also look for if you are interested you know at results of these competitions held annually that has been almost proven right recently there was a little bit change in this finding wherein they found out that neural networks you know were performing slightly better than the simpler time series methods in generating a forecast right the fifth point is consensus is required to build a better forecast why right while we expect right as analyst as data scientist right uh steven uh, i'll uh, don't recollect the exact name but i'll uh, just uh, in the break i'll find out and give it to you okay yeah okay point number 5 is consensus is required to build a better forecast right and why so while as site data scientist while as statisticians or demand forecasters model builders right data experts we would want our models to be as accurate as possible right and maybe not you know let sales marketing or anyone else touch the forecast you know uh, pollute or contaminate the forecast but the reality is that in most of the organization there is a human factor as well right because they and uh, the other challenge is that it is not always possible for a demand planner or a data analyst or a uh, you know any other analyst to explain why a why a forecast like that it is very difficult to explain a exact number by machine had thrown this number so explainability of the result coming from a model becomes a challenge right so when demand planners or demand forecasters or data analysts or business analysts or you know these people are not able to explain the logic or the reason behind why machine has given a certain number the trust sort of comes down it become very difficult to sell that number to a uh, subject matter expertise like somebody mentioned or to say is marketing right so they would want to bring in their view they would want to you know validate the numbers which are being given by the machine right so, and culturally in most of in some of the organization they would want sales marketing finance supply chain you know commercial any any other team from commercial to study validate that focus because they want consensus and buy in from everyone right because tomorrow let's say forecasting is done by supply chain and supply chain says no i am not going to take any input from anyone right either sales marketing then they may not support that number right because organization want all of the people to deliver that number when i say deliver to sell that much as they have committed on the forecast right so to bring commitment to bring buy in to make these people an integral part of the demand planning process consensus is seen as an important step an important activity and sometimes consensus really helps right so there could be baseline forecast accuracy for example the starting point or the baseline accuracy given from the model is 60% but marketing when they provide their input they try to enrich the forecast right with consumer offers you know the kind of uplift it can give the media the brand endorsements right so similarly sales can bring in views you know they may have access to competitor activity because they are very much on the ground so area sales people right they know what competition is doing they can bring those insights they can also help planner know what kind of expansion they are planning in terms of reaching more outlets right and all of that information can really help make forecast more accurate so while baseline accuracy is 60% if your final forecast accuracy is less than becoming 75% that means consensus has really added value right so it is important for a data analyst for a supply chain analyst or for a business analyst to be able to quantify whether the consensus activity is adding any value in terms of 
generating more accuracy for a forecast, right? Okay, point number six, sales is not equal to demand. Is it true? When you look at the historical sales data of any SKU or any product, when you're analyzing the sales data, the comment being made is that it is not equal to demand. Do you agree or it's a faulty statement? The historical sales data is not equal to demand. Is it a correct statement or is it a faulty statement? Okay, Vinay, uh, why do you say that uh, you agree with this statement? Can you elaborate? Hmm. Sometimes it could be more or less, right? So, for example, when you are looking at the sales data, which got recorded in your system, right? So, let me explain your situation, right? So, there was a situation when because of a supply constraint or let's say because of raw material issue or packaging material issue, you went out of stock for two months, right? What will be the sale recorded for that SKU for two months in your systems? You are out of stock. You were out of stock for that SKU for two months. What would be the sales data recorded in your system for that SKU? It will be zero, right? Because you had no stock to sell, right? Now, let's say there is a person who has joined, you know, after one year, you know, he looks at this data and he says, okay, in those two months, the sale was zero, which means there was no demand, which is a wrong inference, right? Demand was there, but organization was not able to service that demand, right? So that sales data is zero because there was no stocks to be sold, right? So demand was not an issue. The supply was an issue, right? Similarly, there could be various reasons, right? Why your sales data may be equal to demand or may not be equal to demand, right? Now, let's look at another scenario, right? That your average demand for the test SKU is actually 20. But in one of the months, we saw that the sales went up to 80. So is 80, so did demand really go up to 80? Should we, should we draw that inference as an analyst? Did demand really become 80? Most probably no, right? Because there could be a trade scheme. There could be a distributor scheme that if you buy four times of your average demand, you will be sent to Singapore. If you buy three times of your demand, you will be sent to US, right? So there could be some incentives which could have driven, right? Sales people to sell more and distributors to buy more, right? But that's not the actual increase in demand, right? That's an artificial spike in the demand. So you are, when you are looking at the sales data of past, when there are such outliers, you have to find out the reasons, right? Behind those outliers and bring the data to its proper state, right? Maybe replace that data with mean of the data or median of the data or do some outlier treatment, right? So sale, whatever sales data that you are seeing in the past, it may or may not be equal to demand. It could be high, like somebody mentioned, it could be even less, right? Point number seven, which we will see uh, a lot many times, you know, in our rest of the discussions, so that forecast is used for variety of purposes in the organization. Forecast is used to you know, do budget planning, right? So if there's a forecast, you can know what could be, what is going to be my revenue, what is going to be my profit, what is going to be my spends, right? You can use the same forecast. Uh, that same forecast can be used by HR to do workforce planning. The same forecast is being used by supply planners, factory planners, and RM uh, packaging material planners to plan for their production, plan for their manufacturing, plan for their uh, raw material, packaging material, right? So forecast, right? serve a lot of purposes, right, in the organization, okay? Now, we have seen all of these factors affecting the demand, past demand, right, which is using historical demand, the shorter, the better, right? 
advertising and spend state of economy price discount all of these are demand drivers or all of these variables right lead time which can impact right uh, the demand of your product okay we had seen in a last discussion what do we mean by a forecast right when we say that demand planner has to share a forecast demand planner should very clearly specify that a particular product a is going to sell how much at what time right in what uh, and at what location right for what customer right the so product a is going to sell 100 units in may month right in calcutta location or maybe Calcutta, which customer, right? So to that level of granularity, a forecast information should be provided for rest of the supply chain to do procurement planning, to do supply planning, to distribution planning, right? Any question on this? Because these are very important basic principles, which all of you as analysts, right, need to understand, right? When evaluating or when getting into the forecasting exercise. Any questions on this? Okay, so uh, it's 8.15, right? So we are uh, already covered uh, half of our uh, session duration. So let's take a break. So we'll take 10 minutes break and we'll be uh, meeting at 8.25, okay? Okay, everyone? Okay, so let's meet at 8.25, yeah.
Hi everyone. Are all of you back now? Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, Stephen, uh, did you uh, could you see the response that I've given on those competition that you were asking? Okay, so I think one second. Huh? I think that is going only to host and panelist. Let me do it for everyone. Can you see it now? Okay. Okay, so Stephen, your uh, second question was, could we conclude point number three in all cases? No, so I think uh, that was uh, the explanation which I gave in detail, right? So it is, no, it is not true for all cases, right? So there will be certain exceptional situations or uh, you can come across cases where your forecasts are more accurate at lower level than at aggregated level. So it is not, uh, uh, it's not hundred percent true. Okay. Would the reason always be seasonality? No, the reason would be, uh, reason could be anything, right? So like I said that it could be any characteristics of a time series, which could be trend, which could be seasonality, which could be cyclicity, anything. And it can be uh, superimposing, right? Uh, on the benefit that you are getting from the aggregation. Okay, so let's move on, right? So what are the challenges uh, one can face, right? So let's say if you're into the business of forecasting demand or you're a demand analyst, right? So what you will observe, right? Uh, there are certain, uh, like, so we had already seen certain elements, right? Uh, which you need to carefully observe. So if you are in, into modeling or if you are into, you know, designing algorithms, so some of these aspects, right, which you have to, as an uh, as a, as a analyst need to be aware of when you are uh, generating a reasonable and an accurate forecast, right? There are a host of other challenges as well, right? So these are some of them. So for example, one is demand interpretation, right? So what it means is, so demand for the product key pricing in amount with every chain element and with a certain lag, right? So what it means is, for example, the customer demand is at a certain point in time, right? So let's say so uh, your x-axis is time and uh, y-axis is quantity, right? So the customer demand is observed at this point in time, but this demand at a retailer end, it will be seen with a certain lag, right? Because customer is already holding certain inventory, right? And this demand to a retailer is a little bit increased, right? Because retailer will try, right, to give a different view on the demand, right? Uh, because a retailer is not very sure. So retailer may say, okay, you know, customer demand is variable. So I might want to pass on a higher demand, right? To my distributor. Again, this demand to a distributor is uh, reflected with a certain lag <clears throat> and it is higher in intensity, right? Because retailer is passing, a uh, distributor is passing on uh, that demand with a certain uh, lift, right? From uh, his side, right? Similarly, manufacturer. So each one of them are adding a certain amount, you know, from their end because they don't trust the demand which is coming from the downstream partner, right? So this impact, right, wherein every element in the supply chain is adding, you know, or creating an inflation in the demand is called as a bull whip uh, impact, right, or a bull whip uh, effect. And this is the core uh, element or this is the core learning that you are also uh, going to do uh, in your simulation of uh, root beer game, right? And you will notice this kind of uh, bull whip uh, effect, which is uh, at play there, right? <clears throat> the second challenge is demand pressure, right? So there's a sudden rise to fulfill demand causes distress in the complete supply chain at times become key, right? So it is not that one can fulfill the demand, uh, you know, at their own comfort level in their own speed time, right? So there is a service level agreement, right? So when you are trying to fulfill uh, order of retailer or retailer, right? So you have to meet that demand, right? In a certain agreed upon time, right? So if you have to manage your inventory in a way, you have to manage your upstream supply chain in a way that availability and service levels, right? Are always paramount and available to meet the customer demand, right? 
market demand right so when you are servicing a certain demand like we said that there is a lag in the process right so by the time you make the product available in the market it could so happen that there is no more demand right and your product has become obsolete so if your route to market or go to market is not quite fast enough uh, your product can end up uh, turning obsolete right inventory management so we all know right so there is a issue with the forecast so forecast can either be less or forecast can either be more so if you have forecasted less which means that there was more demand and while you were able to service some of that additional demand with the help of safety stock or with uh, the help of some additional stock that you were carrying but if the demand spike is more than what you could service even with the help of safety stock there is an opportunity loss right so if you your forecast was correct and you had enough inventory you would have got more revenue and possibly more profit right so if you are doing less forecasting many a times it can result into an opportunity loss right the other scenario is when you have forecasted more or you have done over forecasting right which means that there is a positive bias which is over forecasting and the demand for your product in the market is less so you have produced more you have supplied more right now while it will not become a issue right in a near period because whatever you have produced more or you know you have supplied more it can be sold in next month if your product is not end of life or if your product is not dead product right so you can still adjust for that over production or additional supplies in next month right the world is not coming to an end right but you will have to carry that inventory for more for more period so there are associated cost when you produce more or supply more right so there are holding cost inventory holding cost there is inventory logistic cost right there is an additional insurance premium that you have pay to pay on that inventory right so it's a wasteful resource when you carry more inventory than required in your system right there is a other drastic impact also let's say you have produced more right and you have supplied more and this product that we are talking about is a winter care product it's a cold cream or a body lotion right now in a season let's say the demand you predicted is was 1000 units but in the winter season you actually sold only 700 so what will happen to these 300 what are you going to do with this 300 units which you have ended up producing more and the season is now over what will happen to these 300 units if they saying sell with discount but season is over nobody is no but even if you want to sell it at discount nobody wants right so winter is over it's so summer season even if you give it for free people will not buy it they have bought it in winter season consumed in winter season is over now what will you do with this 300 units now yes so steven is saying i will use it for my next winter right so uh, steven uh, are you okay to buy let us say uh, in this winter which is 2022 winter or 2021 product if you go to any store like big bazaar or reliance uh, zio uh, uh, you know reliance mart will you be okay to buy a 27 2021 cold cream or body lo body lotion and let's say in the same shelf there is a competitor who is providing you a same manufacturing same year manufacturing so which manufacturing will you uh, prof, uh, prefer a product 2022 manufactured or 2021 manufactured recent one right so it, it is a possibility that your stocks will not even sell in next winter because competition has done their planning extremely well and in last season they were not left with any stock right so they are producing fresh and selling fresh right so it is not easy so in this case most probably you will be able to maybe liquidate or salvage 100 units out of 300 units for some customer or consumer it doesn't matter whether it's a 2021 manufacturing or 2022 manufacturing as long as that product has not expired or is not near expiry usually body lotion or cold cream have 24 months or 3 years of expiry right but some customers are finicky they are really particular about the shelf life so maybe out of 300 you will be able to salvage 100 or 150 but the rest 150 you have to destroy them right and when you destroy your products it's a real hit to your bottom line right so inventory management right is directly linked to quality of your forecast so if you over forecast or under forecast it can have real impact on your 
ऑर्गेनाइजेशनल टॉप लाइन एंड बॉटम लाइन ओके ओके सो व्हेन वी टॉक अबाउट अ डिमांड फोकास्टिंग प्रोसेस राइट व्हाट ऑल डू वी रिक्वायर टू क्रिएट अ गुड फोकास्ट एंड व्हेन आई से गुड फोकास्ट अ फोकास्ट दैट कैन बी ट्रस्टेड अ फोकास्ट दैट इज हाईली एक्यूरेट a focus that is generated at the right level of granularity a focus that can be explained you know to sales marketing and other stakeholders right and a focus which has accounted for all the drivers all the factors which influences demand right so when you talk about generating a focus there are certain prerequisites right so you need business inputs you need a process right through which you are going to gather those inputs right it is not enough to have those input it is also required to be able to study the impact of those input whether those inputs have a positive correlation whether those inputs have a negative correlation what is going to be the estimated uplift what what is going to be the estimated cannibalization impact right so with efficient processes you need to gather those inputs and study the impact of those inputs on your uh, forecast right and you need to have very high data quality right like i said that when you are referring to historical sales data you cannot refer to historical sales data as is right because we just saw and we just discussed that your historical sales data may not truly really reflect the state of demand in past right because there could be lot of outliers in terms of uh, service issues there could be lot of outliers in terms of uh, you know uh, artificial spikes in demand which got generated because of lot of uh, trade schemes or lot of uh, consumer offers which were given right so you need to have one access to historical sales data you also need to know the context or the various you know uh, environmental factors in which that sales data got uh, accumulated and you also need to have access to future drivers you know how your future you know inputs are planned how economy is going to grow how competition are going to do in future right all of that understanding to create a reasonable and an accurate forecast right can you tell me what is the recent phenomena that is making this prerequisite difficult for uh, forecasters for analyst what is the recent phenomena which is creating a nightmare in lives of for people who are for who are dealing with demand forecasting yes so sumit is right right anu is right pradeep is right right so covid has created lot of outliers in 2020 it has created outliers in 2021 right so for example in 2020 when you look for historical data and i am not sure which industry you belong to or which uh, you know uh, organization you work for but if you are into a product industry or an industry which is into manufacturing right and if you are not even if you are from e-commerce right because e-commerce as a channel did not see much of the impact of covid in fact it saw a positive impact right because people went to e-commerce to you know start uh, you know buy the categories which they were buying from non e-commerce channels right so but if you look at traditional channels right so you know that half of march was wiped out april was almost zero may was about 60 to 70% of pre covid level june started coming back we were about 80 to 90% of covid levels and july onwards you know the businesses started coming back right and then there are two market in indices or indexes which are published so i don't know if uh, anyone has uh, heard about uh, i'm going to type in the chat nomura business index and pmi rating have you heard of these two indexes uh, which are uh, present which are published uh, which are published and which shows the uh, recovery of the economy has anybody heard about these uh, two indexes nomura business index and pmi rating okay basically these two ratings tries to tell you know whether the business or whether the economy has recovered you know to pre covid level so it's a relative score right so whenever covid hit right it says that okay the current state of business or current state of economy is 20% of the pre covid level right so even these 
indicators right uh, were making uh, you know uh, life difficult in terms of uh, you know the data that has got uh, gathered right so we know all of this data are creating issues for planners right because if they are trying to forecast for the same period for next year or next two year this data in past is really impacting right so what are these people doing they are trying to correct the data they are trying to replace these outliers with some sensible data and there are a lot of techniques in which you can identify outliers then you can correct the outliers this step is called as outlier detection and correction and it is part of a step in the process which is called a history cleansing exercise so before you start forecasting you have to first clean the historical sales data right only when you have cleansed the historical sales data free from outliers free from you know data quality issues then that data becomes modelable that that data becomes consumable by algorithms and different models to generate a meaningful forecast right so once you have access to business inputs once you have access to uh, once you a demand planning process or forecasting process is well defined and you have access to high quality right to highly dimensional data then there are uh, uh, certain steps right or certain pre uh, requisite right in terms of processes so first as a team as an organization you need to define the scope right so what is the forecasting being done for are you going to generate only short term forecast or mid term forecast or long term forecast because all of these three forecasts uh, serve different purposes right the so short term will be done for immediate uh, you know target planning goal planning right immediate uh, supply of stock long term forecast which are let us say 12 months and beyond will be able to do capacity planning right to set uh, you know and uh, to set goals in future to see if you need more uh, lines more manufacturing lines right more plants and all uh, about new launches right so first we have to define the scope in terms of granularity in terms of what products right in terms of horizon right second once we are clear on the scope we have to gather the data and like i said data treatment you have to cleanse or you have to clean the data so that it is ready for modeling it is ready for you know uh, put, to be put into an algorithm right as an input and an output can be generated then once you get the data then you have to create a forecasting strategy and we will see what is meant by forecasting strategy because every sku all of you understand what sku is what is meant by an sku you all of you understand hello hello yeah okay okay so all skus right so for example your organization sell 1000 skus right but all skus may not have let us say 24 to 36 months of data right some of these will be new launches so they may have 6 months data they may have 2 months of data right they may have let us say 3 uh, months of data or they were just launched last week right so new launches will have a variety of data in terms of historical data right then there will be certain uh, sku which are at end of life right so all the products may not be at the same stage of their life cycle right and your model or your algorithms by default as a prerequisite may require 24 to 36 months or 12 months of data to be able to take into account level trend seasonality cyclicity right to be able to replicate the patterns in future right because what is a model what is an algorithm it tries to capture some of these repeatable patterns from the historical sales data and project them in the future right and then create a forecast right similarly your all 1000 sku's so for example if your company is selling 1000 sku's all 1000 sku's may not be stable right or may not have same degree of variability so there will be some sku which are let us say a class there are some sku which are b class there are some sku which are c class right so in terms of their contribution to business similarly some of these sku's within a class could be highly variable that it is very difficult to predict right sometimes if in a month they sell 100 sometimes in another month they will sell 20 right so they say they show that kind of variability some sku's may be highly seasonal right some of them may be pretty stable demand right uh, wherein their coefficient of variation is under control right so they may exhibit or demonstrate the variability across a spectrum similarly all sku's like i said may not be you know 
A class, right? So A class, let's say, are only twenty percent of the SKU contributing to eighty percent of your business, right? So you cannot have a single or a same treatment for every SKU customer combination. So let's say you want to forecast every SKU customer, right? To say what is going to be bought by this customer, you know, this particular product. So whatever is the granularity of your forecast, you need to study whether this is forecastable or not. whether the historical data is stable enough for the model to replicate the patterns in future right so you have to segment you have to create segments to see whether what are those segments which can be easily forecastable what are those segments which are difficult to forecast and hence will need more consensus right so you have to first do a segmentation study forecasting strategy a study to find out which sqs can be forecasted which cannot and apply a required treatment to get a reasonable forecast right so first you define scope then you prepare data then you do a forecasting strategy segmentation analysis right and once you are uh, done with your segments then you go ahead and generate the forecast right and forecast can be generated with both qualitative and quantitative uh, ways right uh, which we will uh, see shortly okay so first let's look at data preparation right so scope is clear okay so let's say we want to forecast all uh, at an item level or at an sq level so we want to generate the forecast for 1000 items right and we are saying we want to generate the forecast at a national level and we want to generate the forecast for next 12 months rolling 12 months so that's our scope okay now we have to prepare the data right now when we talk about data so data can be master data Right. Okay, data can be transactional data, which is sales data, and data can be your demand drivers data. So, what is meant by demand drivers data? What was the events? What was the schemes? What were the promos which were run in the past? And what are the schemes or what are the promos? What are the media which are going to run in the future? Because you need to know all of them to be able to see the uplift. or negative impact on the demand it is good if you can have access to competitor data also you know or other macroeconomic uh, indicators but you need to gather all of this data to be able to create a forecast right now where all of this data will come from right so master data which could be material master or customer master could be coming from sap right or from your core transactional system right your sales data could be coming from sap or er or any other erp system right or it could be coming from your uh, uh sales software which are implemented at distributor and right uh, there could be other uh, systems right uh, which are deployed right Uh, in your organization which could give access to historical demand driver data of future drive most of the places the demand driver data is not uh, lying in any system it is either available in excel files presentation pdf right but the point is to gather all of this data process treat this data so that it can be studied it can be uh, ex some exploratory analysis can be done on this data to form some initial view to form some initial understanding of how the data is what the quality of data is right so when we talk about data it can come from various sources and what all data we are talking about historical sales data right uh, it could be based on historical shipments it could be point of sales data if available uh, we can have access to historical promotions like i mentioned you know you can have some other uh, external variables like weather data right uh, competition activity drivers can be 100 of 100 of them right so there could be many so like i said okay so we have to study the data right in terms of quality and if the quality is not good when we say quality is not good we are saying there are many outliers in the data which can make prediction very difficult right so what is an outlier an observation is said to be an outlier if it is very far away from the remaining values statistically these extreme values can manipulate the forecasting result right so it can distort the forecasting results and it can make it difficult to understand right so it is very important to identify them right identify the reason behind them and correct them when we say correction of outlier data which means that you have to basically replace that outlier with a certain another data point now there are various op options of replacing that outlier data right either you can replace it with mean of the rest of the data right or you can do a mode you can do a median right or you could you know replace it with any other data which is let us say consensus based uh, uh, derived right you can do a forward casting you can do a back casting so there are various ways in which outliers can be 
replaced, right? And similarly, there are various ways in which outliers can be automatically identified because when you are trying to forecast for thousand SKUs, right? Here we are talking about national forecast, but if you were to forecast thousand SKUs at a customer level, right? Uh, imagine, you know, nobody can do that activity manually, so you need to have statistical ways of identifying the outliers automatically, right? So what are some of the outliers, right? So any blank or zero data point, right? Between the first data point and the last, this is missing data, right? So one is outlier data. There could be a time series wherein you can have missing data points, right? So even missing data points or intermittent time series wherein more than 30% of your data is missing, right? Can make it difficult for you to do the prediction, right? So you need to also identify if there's any missing data or intermittent time series, right? Because you have to have time series, which is continuous in nature to be able to forecast, right? So like I said, what are the different uh, outlier automatic outlier detection methods? So these are some of the statistical techniques, which are given as a standard feature or a package solution in some of the planning or forecasting software, right? So these are interquartile range tests you know, standard deviation test, right? So you can configure or you may say, okay, whatever is beyond plus minus two sigma. So there's a mean, there is a one sigma plus one sigma minus two sigma plus two sigma minus, right? Any value beyond this has to be identified as an outlier. If you configure that rule in the forecasting software, it will automatically show you that these are the outliers as per that definition. Similarly, in interquartile range, you may say anything which is below 25% of data or above 75% of data has to be identified as a um, you know outlier, right? So all, all of these automatic uh, ways can help you quickly identify outlier and correct them, right? And outliers are to be validated right it is not that system has identified outliers and you blindly you know correct all of them because for example there are certain outliers and these outliers are because every april you do a promo so let's say you are forecasting for a product called a horlicks now horlicks every you know uh at the uh when whenever there are school vacations you know they come out with attractive offers like a bat free or a ball free or anything free right for students and usually it is seen that in vacation times uh, you know the sale of horlicks increases right now if this is a regular feature if it is an annual feature you wouldn't want it to get removed from your sales history right so what what will happen because you've configured this into the system it will be identified as an outlier and it will be corrected but you have to then reject this proposal from this uh, machine or from the algorithm to say no i want these outliers to be present because in future also i'm going to do a similar scheme and hence i need to know that what is going to be the possible uplift if i run a similar offer in april next year right so these have to be validated to see whether planners or whether forecasters or analysts are okay to remove these outliers or not right and then outliers have to be replaced or corrected right so like i said you can replace it with mean you can replace it with nearest neighbor you can replace it with standard deviation right so you can do a lot of treatment but the idea in doing all of this activity right here is to feed system feed algorithm feed model high quality meaningful data because all of you would have heard in uh, saying right garbage in garbage out right it is almost as cliche you know as possible you know it can be but it is very true right so most of the time the poor quality of forecast is directly attributed to poor quality of data that has gone inside the algorithm or model right it is very less and it is very less often when the model is challenged or model is questioned so the first challenge is always on the data right so a lot of pre-work has to go behind preparing the data even before the modeling gets uh, you know started okay so the third step was the so first step was scope second was to prepare data you know data cleansing outlier treatment and all of that and once the data is ready, you have to do the analysis to say whether these SKUs are even forecastable or not, right? Or what could be the challenge in forecasting some of these SKUs given the data that you have, right? So once you have the data, with the help of uh, the cleanse data, you can create two segments. So ones which can be forecasted and the others which cannot be forecasted, right? So ones which cannot be forecasted at all, right? So there we are saying it is make to order, right? Because there, there cannot be any forecast, right? So once you get a demand, once you get an order, 
only then you will get into production so there will be a certain lead time involved in providing or servicing the customer demand right but if you look at the data and you say that these are forecastables there can be two cases right either these are continuous demand forecasting unit what are dfu's demand forecasting unit it nothing but a element which you are forecasting so if you are plan to forecast at an sku customer level then sku customer combination is called a demand forecasting unit if you have chosen to forecast an sku national level sku national level is called a demand forecasting unit so when you are analyzing the historical data it can fall into two buckets so either the data is intermittent right and we saw if more than 30% of the historical data is uh, you know missing data or zero or uh, data it is called as intermittent uh, uh, series right and uh, continuous is when you have uh, um, the data for all the timestamps right so let's say if you are forecasting monthly so there is a monthly data right uh, every month data uh, so let's say you are uh, using two years of historical data so you have data for all 24 months if you are doing weekly forecasting for last one year so you sh should have 52 weeks of continuous data right so those are called as continuous demand forecasting uh, units right so what's the intermittent? So if there's a missing data for more than 30% of data points, right? Uh, or if there are consecutive missing values in the data series, which exceed 5%, right? So that is called as intermittent data. And uh, so once you get access to this, you are doing a forecasting analysis, right? And how you are doing the forecasting analysis? So there are two access, right? So you have created a two into two segment, right? And uh, this two into two segment is based on the sales volume and a parameter which is called as forecastability, right? So what we are trying to say here is, if the sales volume are high and the forecastability is high, right? So this is the decision making, right? So what we are doing is we should go ahead with generating the stat forecast. Why? Because high probability of getting a good forecast and the sales volumes are also high, right? So focus on statistical methods for forecasting the sales manager override, right? Now, second case where forecastability is low and sales volume are high, which means that, you know, because of high variability, right, because of high variability or because of intermittency or because of, you know, not having access to demand driver data, right, you are not able to generate a good forecast. So there you need to generate a high forecast using more of consensus, right, which is collaboration, right. There could be a third bucket wherein forecastability is low, even demand is also low, sales volume is also low. So there it is being said to do it on a make to order point or do or drive the demand fulfillment or servicing of demand by using inventory as a lever and not demand as a lever, right? And the fourth bucket is where sales volume is low but forecastability is high. So again, stat forecasting can be used, right? So this really, for example, if you have 1000 SKUs to forecast, you can plot these thousand SKUs into you know this uh, two into two matrix to say okay these fifty SKUs are you know we can clearly be dependent on the stat forecast you know possibly we don't have to touch it right and not build consensus and we can get a eighty to ninety percent accurate forecast right and at the same time there are let's say seventy SKUs where we cannot expect the forecast to be good we should not waste our efforts in generating a forecast for the 75 SQ, we should put these SQs on demand driven, you know, fulfillment, which is, uh, you know, uh, make to order or, you know, keeping such certain inventory as a buffer, right? So that gives a lot of uh, comfort level, right? That is a very sensible way of generating the forecast and it is only possible because of analytics, right? Now, some of you would have asked, okay, we understand sales volume, right? So we can simply plot, right, uh, by seeing uh, which are those SQs which are contributing high, right? We can do ABC analysis, right? How do we calculate forecastability, right? So forecastability can be calculated, right, or can be mapped for a particular SQ or for a particular SQ customer combination uh, using, you know, various features of that time series. One common feature is called as the coefficient of variation. So if you have 12 months of historical data, you can calculate a coefficient of variation which talks about the time series being highly variable or less variable. If coefficient of variation is high, it means that it is very difficult to predict this time series, right? So that way you can map and say, okay, this SQ is highly forecastable, this SQ is not forecastable, right? You can also use 
lot of other uh, features to you know map or to classify SKUs under high, medium, and low forecastability. For example, intermittency, right? Quality of past data, autocorrelation, right? But most common uh, way of creating segments of on forecastability is called as coefficient of variation, right? So let me uh, uh, show you a real case study, right? Uh, so it's not all theory or it is not, uh, you know, uh, that it's already, it's only in books, but there are organizations which really put this to use, right? And one example that we are going to see is that of Nestle, right? Uh, so Nestle, uh, most of you would know, right? It is a very popular FMCG organization, right? Uh, in the world and some popular products are uh, Maggie, right? And uh, Nestle coffee. So they are one of the leading companies which have perfected the art of demand forecasting, you know, and they deploy a lot of analytics, heavy analytics, right? In generating highly accurate forecast, right? So what you see here is a similar chart. And this is right from Nestle, right? So what you see here, you know, a two by two matrix, they also do a similar activity, right? And their activity while X and Y axis are uh, changed here, right? So X axis talks about volatility, right? And uh, Y axis talks about uh, the size, right? In terms of contribution to the business, right? And they classify their products in four buckets, right? So you can see mad bulls, right? So basic, basically it's an animal farm, right? So the SKUs, which are highly variable, right? So mad bulls are which are highly variable, which are very difficult to forecast. And they also contribute to the business are called as mad bulls. So it is very difficult to tame or predict these mad bulls, right? Then there are certain jackrabbits, right? Where these are those SQs where variability is high, but the contribution to business is low, right? And then there are mules, you know, insignificant, right? Uh, very low contribution to business and the variability is also low. And then there are some SQs which they label or they classify as horses, right? Which are, you know, con big contribution to business and their variability is also low, which means they're very easy to predict or, you know, they can easily generate the forecast, right? So they do this classification and let's see how do they make certain assumptions or how do they create a unique forecasting strategy basis that analysis, right? So let me just pull this document and show it to you. And you can access uh, this uh, document uh, through Google also. Okay, so let me just quickly show this to you. Can some of you confirm if uh, the document is visible? The PDF document? Okay. So this is a paper, right? Uh, from someone called as Marcel from Nestle. And uh, they are, the title of the paper is that how predictive analytics, right? So they are talking about predictive analytics, right? Which is third level in terms of maturity, right? And how they were using analytics to turn mad bulls. So we saw mad bulls on the chart, right? Which are highly variable, difficult to predict. And at the same time, the contribution to business is high. So it is very important for the organization to be able to predict them, right? They can't leave them to auto mode, right? And how they converted them to predictable animals, right? So what, what you saw, right? Uh, and let me just uh, make use of certain, right? So this is port portfolio segmentation, right? And see in Nestle also what we have studied, right? So they clearly said that it's a prerequisite in all forecasting projects, right? So you need to clearly before starting for a forecasting need to know what are your various segments, right? Look at these statements which we discussed, right? Not all products are equally predictable, right? Nestle use animal name for its segmentation and animal behavior translate well into how the planners should plan all of these products, right? Mad bulls are those products which are, which are tough to be predicted, which are tough to predict if we do not know what is causing their vol volatility, right? So they're highly volatile, right? We saw that horses are easier to deal with because their coefficient of variation is less, right? And modern time series based met statistical methods can tame mad bulls as they allow adding explanatory variables into the models, right? 
So this is giving a hint that how they were able to convert mad bulls into predictable animals because other than time series, they also tried studying that what makes mad bulls so variable, right? What are the main drivers? What are the main explanatory variables behind this variability, right? And if they're able to gather the information, gather the data around those variables, they can record the correlation between those drivers and the sales data, and it will make prediction easy or you know possible for the mad bulls, right? So I was saying that there are some softwares, right? Uh, organizations like Nestle, they don't do forecasting manually, right? In Excel files. So see, Nestle now complements its SAP-based demand planning solution with predictive analytics technology provided by SaaS, right? To overcome these issues in an industry that is highly promotion driven, right? So I will not go through the whole document, but it just to, you know, and take some time, go through the document. It, nicely explains, you know, the kind of portfolio segmentation that we had spoken about, right? So I mentioned ABC XYZ analysis, right? With the help of ABC and XYZ analysis, they create, uh, you know, this kind of uh, portfolio and they basically these segments decide, okay, which ones are they need to focus on, right? So basically for a mad bull, you know, they're given a typical graph wherein, you know, you can see a lot of spikes and troughs, right? And this is the point of sales data of a coffee product in Europe, right? And they're trying to analyze, right? Why there are irregular peaks, right? What could be the main reason, right? So the, see this comment, the only way to tame this mad bull is to find the cause behind this peak and quantify it, right? And fortunately in this case, this is quite straightforward. It turns out that this product is regularly pro promoted by price discount of up to 20% and there's a strong correlation between demand and the price discount, right? So they were able to find out the reason why this product will show, you know, recurring spike and trough in the demand, right? So they tried to find out the correlation between price and the sales and they were able to identify a certain, uh, you know, uh, correlation. And when they linked this price discounting with the demand, they were able to study the spike. Otherwise, Previously, they were simply getting a straight line, right? So with the help of this predictive analytics, right, they were, they're able to, uh, you know, do better forecasting for their mad bulls, right? So it's an interesting document, right? Uh, uh, it's uh, shared in the uh, presentation. You can also Google, you know, you can uh, write this uh, uh, title of the paper and uh, go through it, okay? The idea was to just tell you that this segmentation that we're talking about is not a, you know, paper thing or on paper thing. It is very much used and it is being used by one of the leading FMCG companies out there in the market, right? Uh, to create segments and then uh, have a very uh, specific and a very uh, customized approach, right? In terms of uh, improving the forecast, okay? Okay, so what we saw, so forecasting techniques, Right. So we said there are two types of uh, categories, right? So there are qualitative forecasting, there are quantitative forecasting, right? When we talk about qualitative forecasting, there are basically four main approaches, right? So we can do market research. We can get consensus from a certain panel, right? Certain subject matter expertise, right? They know industry, they know competition, they know products, right? We can do history analogy, right? Wherein we can look for a similar product which already exists in our catalog, right? Or which already exists in the organization. Try to understand from that existing product if we can get some signals, if we can get some starting point to, AB, to be able to forecast, right? Or we can use another variant of panel consensus, uh, which is called a Delphi method, which is again to build consensus uh, by taking estimates from certain uh, subject matter expertise, right? The second is straightforward, which is more dependent on availability of historical data, right? Availability of demand drivers or explanatory variables. And uh, whether whether we are forecasting only basis historical data or uh, basis uh, variables, it will it accordingly classifies, right? So we'll see time series forecasting, lot of methods will be there, causal there will be lot of methods, right? Now, one question I want to know, right? In what cases, will you be using qualitative and not quantitative? In what cases will you be using qualitative forecasting methods?
with a great point when the first time product launch we are going to do in case of new launches very good dipti saying when we don't have access to historical sales data very good joginder very good historical limit right so if we don't have data right historical data because if we have historical data good quality data we can identify certain patterns and as long as we can assume there's another point which you guys have not mentioned there could be data right it's not that data is not there and only then qualitative is being used there will be situation where data is there but that data is not useful right so let's say when covid hit was any of the pre covid data useful for forecasting when covid hit was any of the pre covid historical sales data useful for forecasting no right so there was no dearth or shortage of data it was that that data was no more useful right you had to do daily or weekly forecasting to see what is happening on the ground in reality which cities are being logged which cities are being you know lockdown has been uh, you know uh, lifted right uh, what are the products which are being allowed to sell you know what are the products which are in essential categories which are not in essential categories every day uh, decisions were being done right every day there was some new information right and you had to make use of that information to uh, generate the forecasting so it was not just within the covid period that you were not able to use the data which had existed pre covid even post covid in many industries in many channels pre covid data was rendered useless because consumer behavior changed drastically after covid right many of us uh, you know or let's say people who were not used to buy buying from online they became first time customers you know and when they became customers they are not going back to their traditional channels or earlier channels of buying the product right so for some industries you know buying behavior changed so much that most of the data of pre covid was rendered useless right so in those cases what do you do right so it could be about new launches it could be about cases where data is quality is not good it could be about cases where data is there but it is no, not of any use wherein you would want to get a qualitative input right there could be scenario where data is there data is useful also right but let's say data is there you have 36 months of data right and you have generated a forecast right and that forecast let's say you have grown in past by 10% right you have looked at 3 years of data and you have grown maximum by 10% so what will be the growth percentage that will be given by the forecast for next year can your forecast can your machine give you a 30% forecast growth if you had grown only by 10% in past if you have grown only by 10% in past will machine can machine give 30% growth for next one year most probably no right because it is based on historical data it is looking at distribution of historical sales it is looking at mean it is looking at maximum selling data it is looking at minimum selling uh, data right and it will try to give you a similar distribution right maybe because of a trend growing trend it can give you a higher data but most of the time it will be limited by bounds of your historical sales data right by the probability distribution curve right now if let's say you had grown maximum by 10% in past and your time series method or your causal forecasting method is only giving you a 10% growth but your managing director want you to grow by 30% so will you now need qualitative inputs from sales marketing and other teams that how do i grow by 30% will you require or not right so there can be variety of situations there can be variety of cases wherein you might have to combine both quantitative and qualitative forecasting to get a reasonable forecast forecast which is explainable forecast which is accurate forecast which accounts for you know your aspiration to grow right lot of things right so most of the time it is going to be a combination which is quantitative and qualitative right but there and one thing which i would like to clarify right i'm not sure if you would have got it from your async content but 
qualitative forecasting is not guesswork it is not a shot in the dark okay so never equate qualitative forecasting as a guesswork it even the qualitative input is coming by a structured process right so when we talk about market research when we talk about history analogy when we talk about panel consensus or delphi method these are official these are very legit very much legit very much applicable structured scientific processes of generating a demand right so they are not guesswork while they may have a little of bit of bias but bias will be even in machine machine can also show you a positive bias negative bias causal forecasting output can be a positive or a negative bias right so bias will be there in each of these methods but qualitative forecasting are an official legit way of generating the forecast okay so it's not a guesswork okay so most of you rightly said so qualitative forecasting technique involve long term decision making when historical data may be scarce or non existent right let's briefly look at what each of these techniques are right so market research right sometimes uh, when let's say uh, organization wants to do a new launch right and they want to understand what consumer traction is going to be whether consumers are going to you know uh, like the idea or concept or not what could be the initial market share that we can look at right how many stores we should be targeting should we be targeting top cities first or towns or you know urban locations right so these are some of the open question that they would want to get an idea right to see what is the uh, potential of this product that they are working on right so they might hire an agency and a market research agency who will you know go about you know doing surveys who would look at competitive products if at all they exist if it is a new to industry product you know they would do customer surveys you know try to find out if customer would like the idea so if let's say you know there is a particular target segment segmentation right so this product is being target or uh, being targeted for age groups between 25 to 35 they would want to understand what are their likings and all right so market research first of all will be designed right for a targeted uh, consumer segment and then few estimates would be generated right so market research involve prediction based on the trial of potential technologies or innovations on a few chosen customers right and these few chosen customer op, uh, result or responses are then projected onto a wider uh, base to get that estimate right in panel consensus basically there are a specific set of people right and uh, uh, they are uh, given uh, some information about a product right and then they are given uh, asked to give their view on the estimate side right? and in the panel discussion uh, they know about each other right uh, that Uh, they know who has given this forecast right so the, the identity is revealed the only difference between panel consensus and delphi method is that in delphi method the identity is not known right so you don't know this forecast has come from somewhere right uh, so that uh, to control the bias right so panel consensus is built uh, the concept that better forecast can be reached by a panel of experts from varied domains rather than from one individual right so you want to get an estimate from marketing professional sales professional supply chain finance professional right so there is variety of views and then you can finalize on a forecast right and it can run through a recurring series of steps to uh, you know better the forecast or fine tune the forecast right history analogy i already mentioned maybe one example can help right so you are into uh, a business of manufacturing and uh, distribution and selling of shampoos right and the new product which you want to launch uh, is a 1 liter shampoo pack and you want to you know find out what the initial forecast can look like right so like i said that you are already into forecast into the business of uh, manufacturing distributing and selling shampoos so the nearest neighbor or the most similar product or likely product that you have already in your catalog is a 600 ml shampoo bottle right while you have other configurations other proportions right sizes as well so you have 100 ml shampoo 250 ml shampoo you know of uh, 300 ml shampoo but out of these which one will you pick up right to let's say estimate the original initial demand for a 1000 ml shampoo will you pick up 100 ml or will you pick up 600 ml Six hundred ml, right? Because 
600 ml in terms of pack size in terms of mrp in terms of features would mostly replicate a 1000 ml shampoo right so you would want to first study okay what was the demand you know for 600 ml in which channel it is selling in which city it is selling and try to maybe use that as a baseline demand and maybe try to take up a little lower number than 600 ml right because 1000 ml you may not have lot of customers who would buy such a big pack size of shampoo right so you may say okay i will keep my original demand for 1000 ml bottle as let's say 70% of 600 ml right but it gives you a starting point and you may observe for the first 3 months whether your forecast is going wrong you know uh, whether you are over or under forecasting correctly forecast and once you have Three months or four months of actual sales data of thousand ml, then you can correct it, right? So it's better than having no forecast, right? Or a forecast which is you know coming from nowhere. It is better to do a history. It's also called a lookalike forecasting, right? Uh, now these days, uh, lookalike forecasting is also being done by machine learning, right? So machine learning tried because there in retail, for example. Uh, we were talking about an organization selling 150 SKUs or 500 SKUs, but in retail we are talking about selling 50,000 SKUs, maybe one lakh SKUs, right? So if you sit and start finding lookalikes or anal, uh, you know, analogous SKU, uh, it will be like months before you are able to identify a nearest neighbor, right? So today machine learning is being deployed, and machine learning algorithm will tell planner out of one lakh SKU, these five SKUs are the candidates. or the most near ones to you know demonstrate the same characteristic of this sku the new sku which you are planning to launch and then planner can choose one of them or maybe combine you know choose a combination of them to create a original baseline forecast okay okay so what we have understood right uh, here is the demand uh, forecasting is the uh, approach to predict future demand right uh, demand uh, forecasting helps uh in uh, budget planning in inventory planning in production planning right it's a difficult task because of some of the challenges that we had seen in terms of bullwhip uh, impact the pressure to service demand the pressure to you know not get uh, uh, out of stock or uh, excess inventory right uh we saw uh, uh, the role of qualitative forecasting and host of uh, quantitative forecasting and most importantly we saw some of the very important steps which are involved in the forecasting as a process which was to first set the objective right then uh, get the data right basis the initial exploratory analysis or basis the initial uh, analysis we create segments to see what sqs can be forecasted what cannot and then have the right techniques selected right so that uh, that is what we uh, saw right now let's look at some of the uh examples right and case studies right so before we go to some of the forecasting examples let me first uh, share uh, with you one case study right so what you see here right is uh, one of the projects uh, that uh, i did uh, you know in uh, one of my companies wherein i implemented machine learning to generate the forecast for e-commerce channel right and e-commerce channel is a very dif difficult channel to predict uh, because uh, of very high variability because uh, in e-commerce channel most of the time products are being run on discount right and uh, how many of you have shopped from flipkart uh, amazon nike and uh, retailers like that most of you would have right have you ever bought from flipkart amazon and what drives uh, and what drives uh, your uh, purchase from these retailers what are the top two or three reasons uh, you would you you know like to buy from them yes so steven so that is in fact number one demand driver that we also identified through our machine learning forecasting process so one is the discount that we get right most of the time the price uh, is much lower than mrp right on top of that there are a lot of other offers that there are you know either from the banking partners or payment mode right uh, then we get faster delivery uh, there's a lot of variety right we can compare and buy right so there's a lot of factors right and it makes it more difficult to predict right and especially when some specific events come right uh, most of you would have heard of flipkart big billion days right amazon prime day right then they will run you know some events on around republic day valentine day this day that day right 
and once that this event is over they will you know come out with statistics right and they will say that in one big billion event they sold almost four months of their sales right have you have you seen those statistics once big billion day and amazon prime day is over we have sold so many phones it will create a eiffel tower have you seen those statistics right we have sold so much of uh, you know grocery that uh, it can cover the whole earth five times right have you seen those weird statistics now imagine when those events are run how difficult it is to predict demand right so it's a highly difficult channel to predict and normal or conventional time series methods you know they most of the time fail in forecasting this channel right so what you are seeing is one uh, project which uh, i led and here i am just trying to show you the complexity involved from data analyst work or uh, data scientist work or uh, you know um, anyone who is doing this exercise so this is called as pipeline right <clears throat> and this is a little bit complex than what we had seen earlier which are four or five steps right so what you see is first the data homogenization right so we check data integrity we check data validation you know we set tools for outliers right then we do segmentation right so we abc xyz seasonality trend product life cycle intermittency forecasting level at what level we need to generate forecast then we generate a baseline forecast as a uh, under baseline forecasting step we do outlier correction we apply algorithms we first calculate the uh, forecast using simple methods like moving average exponential smoothing arima right after that we get into some additional complex steps in machine learning which is feature engineering and selection so we create features around uh, item attributes around time attributes around uh, uh, demand driver attributes we do correlation analysis to see which features are important which features are not important right positively correlated negatively correlated then we develop machine learning models right in machine learning models we have lot of complex models right so we have random forest we had cat boost we have light gbm gradient boosting methods and these are all they all belong to data science they are not statistical methods they are data science methods right and after that we train the model right we split our historical sales data into train and test data right we do tournament tournament is basically to select the best algorithm which is available and which is giving the least error for the test period right we do after that we do model fine tuning to see if more features can be added or deleted to further give a better accuracy after the model is finalized and signed off by the client then model deployment is done into an environment so that you know automated uh, forecast can be generated right and after that there is a continuous improvement that happens on the model in terms of identifying the root cause because in future model uh, accuracy can worsen it can become better right anything can happen because the model accuracy that we got during the test period may not be a guarantee that uh, every time in future you are going to get a similar accuracy right and look at the effort involved so you know if you will see almost 20% of the time is get going into feature engineering 20% of time is going into building model right then 15% of time in model fine tuning 20 so all of these are important activities right data is taking about 20% of the effort right so it the model the demand forecasting can become as complex as this and everything requires analysis see all of this is you know with a very loud and this is talking to us and saying that without analysis all of this is not possible right and the whole effort is being put to get an accurate forecast is this clear is this pipeline clear okay 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 now let's look at some of the examples right my previous uh, slide and i want to just get quick responses right basis what we have uh, understood right uh, till now so these are six uh, scenarios right and i want to get your responses so this is the scenario number 1 wherein there is a product and these are 12 months 13 months jan to next jan and the sales history is given right so the sales history of this product is 100 200 250 and 200 
and now you are being asked what is going to be the sales for jan period so you have to forecast for jan what will be your estimate i want to get some quick responses if you are a forecaster and if you have access to four months of historical sales data in first scenario what is your estimate going to be for jan okay so with this saying 200 and sumit uh, whosoever is giving an estimate also just give one line logic that why that number so sumit why 200 okay uh, while uh, can i get responses from other participant as well pradeep joginder pratiksha sumit steven okay vinay singh 200 average uh, pratiksha 200 joginder 160 steven 190 is calculated an average same growth as last month okay okay considering average okay pradeep is saying 200 okay the correct answer or i mean the answer that i was expecting was zero the forecast for jan will be zero can that be a scenario where forecast for jan will be zero as per the planner or as per the analyst okay so see so you are not applying what you have learned right so like i told you that historical sales data is not enough for you to generate forecast right so if you want to be the best analyst if you want to be the best forecaster if you want to be the best uh, demand planner out there right best supply chain analyst i told you along with the historical data you need to know the context you need to know what happened in past you need to know what product are you forecasting is it a seasonal product to what customer is it being sold right you have to ask all of those questions before you even get in or you have to at least assume right so the product you were actually being asked to forecast is the sales data of a winter product right and it's a winter product it is a cold cream or uh, or a body lotion and this product a sales history is for the south region of india and all of you know the south uh, in south the winter is short right and usually unlike in north and east where jan and feb are really winter months in south it is not the case right so if i would have told you that the sales data is for a cold cream in south region would you still give jan forecast as 200 no right so that is what we have been discussing for so long right so for and even to forecast you have to understand what product you are forecasting for what customer it is being forecasted right so what are there any specific if you have seen any outlier in the data you know ask try and see why that outlier right now look at the second scenario right so you again have got four months of historical data september 500 200 november 100 december 75 so tell me what will be the forecast for jan and what and why you are giving that number what is your assumption okay sumit is saying zero okay sumit what is the assumption why zero is any is all, everyone agreeing to zero or anybody has any other observation by looking at the data okay anu says 50 anu what is the reason for 50 anu 50 deepthi 30 guys if you can also give me a reason it will be easy to understand the logic so mitra so mitra is saying considering the same logic of seasonality okay okay because last gen okay uh, all of your data guys right analyst guys so what 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 are you seeing in first four months are you finding an observation i mean this is clearly the data is speaking to you right 500 200 175 what possibly this data could belong to 
in which situations do you see this uh, sort of data? Right, so Anu is saying decreasing trend, right? So Anu, in what cases do you see decreasing trend? Okay, so see this data can belong to two scenarios, right? One is that this product is end of life, right? But which is not the case here, right? Because you have only four months of data, right? Right? The second scenario where this uh, data could belong to is a new launch, right? Because usually when you launch, you launch big, right? In the first month, you sold 500. Then customers, you know, settled for a demand of 200. And demand become more, uh, you know, less 100 in December 75, right? So as a planner, what number will you put for December? If I would be in your place, I would say, okay, it's a new launch. We only have data for three months. And it is still trying to find its position in the market, right? So... Actually, no single data point is a true reflection of what it is going to sell in future, right? The data is decreasing, right? So I would rather say, okay, for the month of Jan, let us be in a wait and watch mode. And I would rather keep Jan forecast as same as December because we don't know, right? If 75 will become 30 or 75 will remain as 75, maybe 75 is the normal state of demand this new launch has, you know, managed to find, right? Are you guys with me? Yeah. Okay. Now let's look at case number three. You have plenty of data. You have 12 months of data, right? Jan to December. 500, 200, 225, 210, 200, 195, 500, 200, 500, 200, 175. What will Jan be? First, tell me what, what do you see from the data? Some quick observation should come. Right. So Stephen made a very valid observation. So there are three peaks in this data. Jan 500, July 500, September 500. These are peaks, right? And not, seasonality is not the right word, but these are the peaks, right? And for the rest of the data, largely it is around 200, right? Except for November and December, right? And we can maybe assume uh, the organization works on Jan to December year. And towards the end of the year, usually most of the distributors, you know, they try to do, you know, clean, cleanse their pipeline or they, you know, don't want to keep that much of stock. So usually towards the end of the year, the sales are a little less, right? So we can make that assumption, right? So if that is the assumption, so you know, there are three peaks and rest of the data is an average, they sell about 200. What is going to be your Jan? So Jan can be two numbers, right? If and this, what you will ask as a forecaster or as an analyst is that what led to these peaks? And if you find out that there were some schemes, promotions or anything, so usually in promotion months or peak months, you get a sale of 500. So you may ask, is there a promotion in Jan? If they say yes, then maybe you can put a number which is slightly above 500 or near 500, right? If they say that, no, there is no input in Jan, then you may put a number which is closer to an average of 200. Is it clear? I think... Case number three was simple, simpler, right? What we are learning here is that both data, you know, we are looking at both quantitative and qualitative way, combined way of generating a forecast, right? Which is explainable, which is trustable, which is sensible, which is going to be more accurate. Is it, is it clear? Are you guys realizing what we are doing? Yeah. Now look at case number four. 190, 85, 200, 200, 200, 195, 210, 205, 200, then back to 190, 75. So here you can clearly see that in the middle of the year, from April to September, April to September, there is a increasing, increased set of numbers, right? Which is almost twice of the average, right? Of the non-season. So this is basically the data that you're looking at is the data of the cleanser, the face wash. You usually face wash, they don't sell much in winter, right? So winter is from October to March in Northeast, right? And if you aggregate the data for India, uh, winter is from October to March and cleansers or face wash don't sell much, right? So their sales in fact become double 
when it is uh, summer season right so that is this is the data for the uh, cleansers and if somebody is asking you to focus jan you will put maybe a number which is 190 right which is a non season number right now look at case number 5 200 180 160 140 120 190 80 60 40 35 30 clearly right what can you see a decreasing trend so mostly this sku is going to be end of life it is going to be a phase out sku or dead sku right so what will you keep as a forecast of uh, january maybe something closer to december or maybe you will put a you will calculate a decreasing trend and put a decreasing trend number right okay what will you put for the forecast of case number 6 what is case number 6 new launch right no past data and we discussed right so we you can do analogous forecasting you can do look alike market research you know you can do panel discussion you can do delphi method right and try to form an initial view right now let's look at one important phenomena right so and concentrate on this table so we are talking about two products product a product b so product a forecast was 100 it sold 80 error is 20 product b forecast was 80 it sold 100 error is minus 20 so what is error forecast minus actual so 100 minus 80 20 80 minus 100 minus 20 overall organization forecasted 180 it sold 180 and error was zero right so tell me is this an issue or not at an overall level they said 180 they sold 180 so their achievement is 100 percent so is this okay or is there an issue with this their overall achievement is 100 percent right is this okay or is this not okay Jogender is saying not okay with me okay and with all others uh, it is okay Anu is saying not okay with me as well not okay right because in product A right so you cannot simply cancel out the error right because this also is an issue this also is an issue so what you do is that you calculate the net error which is an absolute of the error right so absolute of 20 is 20 absolute of minus 20 is 20 so your total error is 40 and how do you calculate forecast accuracy or error you divide error by actuals so when you divide 40 by 180 you get a 22 percent error which means your forecast had an error of 22 percent and an accuracy of 78 percent right in fact, your first item had an error of 25%. While the absolute error in both the cases was 20, but the forecast error was higher in case of product A. Right? Why? Because the same amount of error was done on an actual of 80. Whereas in the second case, the same amount of error was done on an actual of 100. So as a percentage of actual, the error is less in B and the error is more in A. Right? And while sales may say, and usually say it's a habit of sales, right? I said thousand crore, I did thousand crore, right? We are winners. Time to open champagne, right? But no, supply chain got screwed, right? Because you said you will do thousand crore, but you did thousand crore in some other SQ for which we did not have stocks, right? Or we had to do everything, right? Differently to get you the stocks to do thousand crore, right? And it meant additional cost for us, right? Now let's look at extreme example wherein the product is same, but location is different. So you are product A forecasting location A, let's assume location A is Delhi, location B is Bangalore. So you are forecasting A for Delhi and A for Bang and A for Bangalore. So you said I will sell 100 in Delhi, but you actually sold zero. You said I will sell zero in Bangalore, but you actually sold 100. So on an overall basis, product A forecast was 100 and you sold 100 right so overall 100 percent achievement 
but is this an error is this an issue for supply chain is this scenario a big issue for a supply chain or not at all an issue for supply chain big issue right and tell me if the forecast for uh, delhi was 100 and they did zero and forecast for bangalore was zero and they did 100 but how how were they able to do 100 in bangalore because forecast was zero if their forecast was zero in first place how were they able to do 100 of sales in bangalore very good sumit very good maybe they had to move stock from delhi to bangalore right most probably right and for that they had to incur additional cost maybe they had to fly the stock from delhi to bangalore right it's an added cost which means that profitability got impacted right so if you look at the scenario there is a error of 100 in first case 100 minus 0 100 There is a error of hundred in second case. Zero minus hundred is hundred. If you look at absolute hundred, that is two hundred. Error of two hundred on actuals of hundred. Error is hundred percent, right? So you have a case in hand where your business achievement is hundred percent, but your forecast accuracy is zero percent. It is hence possible to achieve hundred percent business with zero percent forecast accuracy. Did you get this? yeah and there is another very important metric which is called as bias the only difference between error and bias is that bias we don't take absolute we take sign of the error so bias is error divided by actual so 20 by 80 25% minus 20 by 100 minus 20% so it comes with along with a sign so when we say positive 25% which means over forecasting when we say negative 20% which means under forecasting so in first case it was over forecasted in second case it was under forecasted right similarly here and bias becomes a concern when there is a consistent over forecasting under forecasting for a certain period of time usually organization define that okay if for continuous 3 months we are over forecasting we have to immediately correct our behavior sometime they will say over 6 months if you are over forecasting we will have to correct our behavior right so it has to be seen over a period of time because it's a sign of habit the sign of a uh, repeated habit which is being demonstrated by an organization or by function so don't see bias in isolation for one month it will not give you any useful information right so bias has to be seen over a period of time if over a period of time you see one month positive second month negative which means it is okay right but if consistently you are seeing positive 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 that means organization has a tendency to overestimate or over project is it clear understood the difference between error bias right and business achievement okay just guys just give me one second uh, pranjay uh, can you please float the feedback form sure so this give me meanwhile one. i'll just take few more minutes so uh, meanwhile you can So guys, uh, uh, just also take some time out to fill the feedback form which Pranjay has just floated. Okay, okay. So we saw forecasting examples also, right? Which was to establish uh, that uh, you know uh, most of the time we have to use uh, a combination of uh, the uh, time series quantitative and uh, qualitative methods, right? We also understood uh, the role of uh, segmentation, right? And some of the KPIs, okay. and anyways the case study we have already seen and this case study is an extreme example of the amount of analytics involved right in problem solving a prediction uh, challenge okay so while we had seen lot of examples already right so i had actually pre anticipated right uh, fetched uh, the content little bit ahead of uh, our discussion so indirectly we have discussed a lot of examples which we should have discussed right here so 
they were all the examples that we were discussing basically uh, a combination right so you guys were already calculating averages you guys were already talking about trends you guys were already talking about seasonality right cyclicity that is nothing but all the elements which one encounters or consider when they are just using the time series methods of forecasting right in some of the examples you guys were looking at see promotions you guys were looking at some other demand drivers right and trying to see if this spike is because of a certain promotion right and some uh, mad bull example that we discussed right uh, we saw there if uh, there was any correlation between the discount and the spike in sale right so when you try to study the impact of one variable on the target variable that is called a causal forecasting right so we had discussed a lot of examples but here we are going to discuss uh, the topic little bit uh, formally right okay so what is a time series right because now we are discussing quantitative uh, methods and we will uh, because for the time given we will slightly touch upon uh, this topic and then uh, you know continue uh, tomorrow so we'll just uh, see what uh, we are going to look at right so when we talk about time series anything that is observed sequentially over time right is called as time series right and when we forecast time series data what is the aim the aim is to estimate how the sequence will continue into the future right so for example what you see here is the australian quarterly beer production right from 1992 to 2010 quarter 2 right and this is how their uh, production beer production has been right uh, in a quarter right and what you see here in the blue line is the forecast and see how nicely it imitates right their historical demand pattern right so this is what is expected when you do forecasting of any time series right so how these observations are going to continue in future right now when you look at any time series basically there are four elements right four components of time series right so what you are seeing here right so let's say this is the time series which is being observed or when you plot the data of a time series you see this particular graph right now you can decompose right this time series into four components right so one is called a trend so we can clearly see that there is an increasing trend right in this time series so this is a plain trend then second component is called as seasonality right so if we and we can decompose we can actually delineate seasonality from this data and we can see that there is a certain seasonality in this time series right the third component is called as randomness which is the noise so anything which is not trend which is not seasonality is called as randomness and there is a fourth component which is not shown here that is called as cyclicity right which is a trend over extremely long term right and that may not appear at a given frequency otherwise it would be called seasonality so there it is not very clear you know what cycles it will be but uh, it can sometimes demonstrate long cyclicity right so all the time series most of the time can be decomposed into trend seasonality randomness and cyclicity right and accordingly we can select the algorithms which are present right to predictly focus to accurately focus sometimes you may not have any seasonality at all in a time series right so you only have to replicate or uh, project the trend in future right sometimes there is no trend and there is only seasonality so you have to only uh, predict seasonality in the future right so when we talk about forecasting a time series it is about forecasting you know the sequence of observations in future it could be for short term mid term and long term and basically two conditions have to be satisfied for you to be able to perform time series right so one is we should have access to all the time series observations in past which is numerical information and we can safely assume that whatever patterns were there in future in past they are replicable in future right they are going to hold true in future as well because if past is not going to be the true reflection of future right in any mat in any form then obviously we it is a useless data right because then we cannot uh, depend on historical sales data and do time series forecasting right so these are two conditions which are to be premet assume right and start uh, as a prerequisite to be able to perform time series forecasting right now there are some examples right and these are problem statements right to uh, where time series forecasting uh, you know is being done or is being uh, asked to done right so forecasting of a table where right so 
this client was a large company right and they were manufacturing disposable tableware such as napkins paper plates right and they needed forecast of each of 100 of item every month right and time series data showed a range of patterns some with trends some with seasonal some with neither right and at that time they were using their own software written in house so they had not bought any software from outside it was a in house software but it often produced forecast that did not seem sensible right and i have highlighted these important points right the methods that they were using was following so they were sometimes taking average of last 12 months data sometimes taking average of last 6 months of data they were using prediction with the help of a straight line regression we'll see what regression is right regression over 12 months regression over 6 months right and then a lot of other various techniques they were applying over this time series to get the accurate forecast right and they basically hired consultants to tell them what was going wrong right and modify software to provide more accurate forecast right so this is one problem statement similar is in case of pharma right and what they wanted to do so in this case the client was australian federal government right and they also needed to perform forecasting and they wanted to forecast the annual budget for a certain subsidy right if they are to provide any subsidy what is the spend going to be in that subsidy right and in order to forecast total expenditure it was necessary to forecast the sales volume of 100 of group of pharmaceutical products using monthly data all the groups have trend and seasonal pattern many groups have sudden jumps up or down due to changes in what drugs are being subsidized right the expenditure for many groups has sudden changes due to cheaper competition these are the highlighting problem statement right trend seasonality sudden jumps right because of cheaper uh, or uh, competition or subsidized right so basically if you are, you are to solve this problem statement of this client you have to find a forecasting method that will that can take into account the trend that can take into account seasonality at the same time it can also account for these sudden changes which are happening because if the model which you are working on if the strategy which you are working on doesn't account or explain for the sudden changes then your future forecast is not going to be correct right so what is a good model what is a good algorithm what is a good uh, uh, approach from any uh, data analyst or a business analyst to be able to devise a model or select a, a model from the available set a one which explains the uh, business behavior right or account for all the drivers which impact the business look at the third example right it's a large car fleet company and they had asked consultants to forecast the vehicle resale value right and if they are able to forecast better right what it will help it will help them control profit it will help understand them what impact resale value you know what increase resale value what decrease resale value and accordingly they can maximize the profit right so they were actually forecasting the resale value by a group of specialist right but these specialist right they thought that if they try to implement any statistical software or any model it is a threat to their jobs so there's a cultural issue also right so this specialist did not want any model or any stat uh, you know algorithm to come into their uh, and replace them right so it's a cultural issue right look at case 4 right here consultants were asked to develop a model for forecasting weekly air passenger traffic right and why they required forecast for passengers and they wanted to plan their domestic route right and each class of passenger right now air passenger numbers are affected by so many things they are affected by school holidays major sporting events advertisements competition behavior right and school holidays often do not coincide with different australian cities right for a specific australian city school holidays are some other time sporting events can move from one city to other right so again here the model that has to be built has to account for these complexities in the given uh, context right so the point there to uh, discuss all of those case studies was to tell you that no one single method is going to work right in every single uh, situation because all say, uh, the behavior of the business can uh, differ very starkly differ very uh, you know uh, in a in a very uh, different manner and then the human factor is for the data analyst for the business analyst for the data science analyst to be able to select the right treatment or right approach 
with the end goal in mind of making the forecast highly accurate highly explainable right is that much clear okay so it's already i think we are uh, running little uh, this uh, taken a little uh, um, bit of time right so what we will do is that we will uh, stop here and we will tomorrow continue from here right so we will deep dive into some of the specific methods uh, of time series uh, of quantitative so we'll discuss few case studies and then move on to inventory management tomorrow okay is it fine everyone okay okay so thank you all uh, i so let's uh, see each other tomorrow uh, for our next discussion thank you pranjay uh, can we conclude now okay i guess okay good night everyone thanks thanks steven for the feedback thank you bye bye